three, two. This is live, ladies and gentlemen. And this is a uh, very unusual <laughs> podcast we're going to have here and a very unusual discussion. I have to my left, Michael Shermer, very famous skeptic. Uh, he's been on the podcast before. Of course, Randall Carlson, amazing gentleman who knows far too much about terrifying things like asteroids and Graham Hancock uh, author also a uh, fantastic human being many times been on this podcast as well and this all came out of a podcast that Randall and Graham and I did recently and Michael Shermer commented on it and it was all essentially on the um, the, the hypothesis that the great extinction that happened um, with the North American land animals uh, that happened somewhere around the end of the Ice Age and um, the end of the Ice Age, the abrupt end of the Ice Age, being caused, please correct me if I fuck any of this up, being caused by uh, a comet impact. Uh, Michael Shermer had some questions about that and we said this would be an amazing podcast to get everybody together in a room and go over this. Uh, since then, there's been some interesting stuff that's happened. Well, I thought this was really fascinating that Forbes has a mainstream article in Forbes, did a comet wipe out Ice Age megafauna. And this is actually from just a couple of weeks ago. And then there was also this interpretation that's fairly recent as well about one of the stone tablets, uh, one of the stone carvings, rather, on Gobekli <coughs> Tepe. And we, Graham, you would probably be the best to describe that. Yeah, that was published in um, Mediterranean... Mediterranean Archaeology and Archaeometry, peer-reviewed journal, uh, by a couple of scientists from the University of Edinburgh. <clears throat> and they are proposing a, an interpretation of uh, the Gobekli Tepe imagery. There's quite a lot of imagery on those T-shaped pillars, particularly one pillar, Pillar 43 in Enclosure D. And uh, their deduction, what they take from their interpretation, of course many will disagree with them, their interpretation is that those, uh, those images are speaking of... Um, the comet impact. They're speaking of a, a comet that hit the Earth roughly 12,900 years before our time. And Randall, this has been something that you've been obsessed with for many, many years now. Uh, you, we've documented it and detailed it in many, in, in many conversations that we've had on the podcast. Uh, yes. <laughs> now, I, I, I can't say that I'm that familiar with that article. I haven't had a chance to get into it. So but I, this I idea that the comet impact is the what, what has caused the end of the Ice Age? Well, it's so complex, but now what we do is we throw a, a, some type of an impact into the mix, and it seems to fill gaps. Pull, that that, have, pull this right up to you. It seems to fill gaps that were, um, at this point, still unexplained. Um, you know, there's varying theories between some extent of climate change and some extent of human predation that caused the extinction. And I've always felt like you can't blame it on one or the other. I think humans probably had a role, but only in the very final stages of the extinction event. And one of the, um, one of the scenarios would certainly suggest that there were extreme climate changes between the ball, what's called the balling alarod, which was the rather gradual warming at the very end of the Pleistocene, which was then followed by the Younger Dryas, which was the return to full glacial cold, and then the end of the Younger Dryas, which is dated at about 11,600, which is considered now to be the the boundary of the Holocene. Post-Younger uh, Dryas, pre-boreal it's called, would be the beginning of the Holocene. And it seems that most of the extinctions did occur between roughly 13,000 and 11,600 years ago, although the dating has a wide spread on it, so you can't pinpoint it down to a specific event. But I've always felt like that there had to be something we needed to look at that triggered the extreme climate changes that we do see at the end of the Ice Age. Um, and, and to my opinion, you can't... Um, attribute that solely to Milankovitch theories, which is basically the changing solar um, terrestrial geometries, because they're too slow. And what we see at the end of the Ice Age were very rapid climate changes. And so one of the things that I think has been missing has been the trigger. Um, Wallace Brecker pointed out er, uh, years ago that possibly uh, a major flood from the draining of Lake Agassiz caused an interruption of the thermohaline circulation, which is the 
basically the circulation of the, the North Atlantic Ocean, and that this might have been what triggered the Younger Dryas and then also contributed to the mass extinction events. But now I think that the dating of the draining of Lake Agassiz is too late for that and was probably a latter event within the overall melting phenomena that occurred between roughly 14,600 and, and about 11,000 years ago. <clears throat> Somewhere in there we have to fit that mass extinction event and, and I definitely have thought that climate change was the dominant factor in that. But then what triggered the climate change? That always seemed to me to be something that was not ever really explained. Um, the comet impact theory is very controversial, but the evidence has been steadily mounting now for a decade. Including physical evidence, right? Like the core samples that show nuclear glass um, scattered out throughout Asia and Europe at a roughly the same time period when they do the core samples? Yes, it's most of it's dating to 12,800 to 13,000 years ago. These are called impact proxies. Yeah. Impact yeah. proxies. Nano, nano diamonds, melt, melt glass, microspherules. These kind of these these kind of things are associated with impact, not necessarily always caused by impact. So this has been part of the reason for the controversy. But it's the abundance of all of these at a particular level which leads a large group of scientists to feel that we have had a comet impact yeah, in, in the past. It's now, the full assemblage of things that is difficult to explain by processes without invoking some type of a, a cosmic event. And it also corresponds with what you believe is a, a period where Earth travels through a, a series of comets. Well, <clears throat> this gets us to the, to the ideas of the, the, what would be called the British neocatastrophists, Victor Klube and William Napier and, and a number of others that have theorized that from time to time Earth encounters <coughs> the debris from a large disintegrating comet. And there's an interesting uh, uh, William Napier addresses this in an interesting article I can pull up here pretty soon, um, that possibly around um, 13,000 years ago, Earth may have encountered some of the debris from a disintegrating comet, which ultimately goes back to uh, Fred Whipple, who is one of the, the godfathers of, of cometary could, science. Could who, I just come in on that for a second? Yeah. Um, I mean, specifically, Bill, Bill Napier, Victor Klube are... are uh, identifying the remnants of this comet uh, with the torrid meteor stream, which is familiar, I think, to everybody. We pass through it twice a year. We see meteorites, particularly at the end of October, early November. That debris stream is still there. It still contains, according to their argument, bits of the comet. There are large objects in it, like Comet Enki, Rudniki, Orgiato, and so on, four or five kilometers in diameter. Uh, and the suggestion is that the meteor stream has got lots of small bits of dust, but it's got some larger stuff too, and some of that stuff fell out of the meteor stream 12,800 years ago and impacted primarily the North American ice cap. Now, Michael, when you listened to that podcast, you had some questions. You are a professional skeptic, so of course <laughs> you were skeptical. What, what are your thoughts about all this? Uh, yeah, let me pull back and, uh, and give a bigger picture. After the podcast, I went and got the book. Magicians of the Gods, and uh, and actually I, I listened to it on audio, so it's I don't know like 16, 18 hours of of Graham reading with his his wonderful British accent, which as you know for <laughs> Americans that elevates the quality of the, of the argument by an order of magnitude. Yeah, that's how they sell things in infomercials over here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Graham, you're a good writer. It's a very compelling story. Thank you. You're a great skeptic. And uh, <laughs> and um, you know, and so uh, I th I think. You know, a, a number of points about, in general, the idea of alternative archaeology, which is really what we're talking about here. I, I prefer that to pseudo-archaeology because that's a little bit of a, it's supposed to be a little bit of an insult. So alternative archaeology. Um, it, so it's good to remember that. So you have these guys on the podcast for three or four hours and the audience listening thinks, yeah, why don't these guys get a fair hearing? I mean, it's like there's the mainstream and then there's these guys. Right. But, but there isn't just these guys. There's hundreds of alternative archaeological theories. So which one gets the play, which one gets attention, which one doesn't? And for a mainstream archaeologist who's busy in the field and trying to get grants and so on, they mostly just don't have the time to sort through all these alternative theories because this is just one. And as we'll see in the next couple hours, there's hundreds and hundreds of things to be addressed. So that's kind of what we do. 
so just to rattle off a few, the lost tribes of Israel who colonized the Americas, Mormon archaeology, explanation of Native Americans, uh, the Kensington rune stones in Minnesota that the Vikings had come here, the Black Egyptian hypothesis. When I was in graduate school, this book called Black Athena <coughs> was published that the Egyptians were actually black and that the you know sort of Western white male dominance of history had written them out of the past. So, you know, this was a whole alternative history, alternative archaeology. Piltdown Man, Thor Heyerdahl, in his hypothesis that the Polynesian islands were colonized by South Americans who went west to, uh, went east to west, that's since been debunked, but that that's yet another one of these things. South American archaeology, Olmec statues seem to have like African features on them. So maybe Africans went directly across to South America. So there's, you know, Eric Van Doniken, uh, Zechariah Sitchin. Now, most of these Graham uh, uh, rejects in, in his book, uh, to, to your credit. So you're a good skeptic, too. <laughs> uh, but but for, for an outsider, to, to an anthropologist from Mars who steps into this thing cold, doesn't know anything, it's like, well, they, they're all alternative, which is the right one. And how do we know? And so what... What, the way it works in science is, is, you know, the default position is the skeptical position. We, we assume your hypothesis is not true, not, not just you, anybody's hypothesis, like the, uh, the Klum-Napier hypothesis. That was widely published. It was uh, widely uh, covered in, in mainstream mm. uh, scientific journals and popular science magazines like Scientific American. And it has not fared that well over the last decade or so. It's, it's still around. It's still debated, but that so you put it in the in the mainstream through peer reviewed journals, and then you go to conferences and you have it out, and and that's kind of where we end up with well this is what we think is probably true for now, and then all these other people out here if they don't jump in and in, into the pool where everybody is, th then there's no way for an outsider to know whether these alternative things have any validity or not other than. They make a compelling case in a popular book, yes, but but what do the mainstream scientists think? So, and the problem is, is that uh, so a couple of specific things like uh, what I call patternicity, the tendency to find meaningful patterns in random noise. You know, the Virgin Mary on a grilled cheese sandwich or whatever. Mm -hmm. Those are fun examples, but you know, taking uh, like um, uh, pectographs, pe pecto pectoglyphs, and then comparing them to constellations. Like you know, here we have some constellations on your roof here. Uh, it, it's easy in the mind's eye to find a pattern. The question is, did those people really think 10,000 years ago, 5,000 years? So this is a, a field called archaeoastronomy. Ed Krupp, uh, our, the director of the Griffith Observatory here in L.A., this is what he does. And sometimes the pattern, he thinks the patterns mean something. Sometimes they're totally random. Uh, and uh, or you take something like the pyramids, you know, as, as, as Graham knows, there's you know, 100 theories about the pyramids. And there's the mainstream one, and then there's all these other ones. And this is why people like the director there, um, you know, has to, he just can't deal with them all, you know. So just as one example I used in my book, um, Why People Believe Weird Things, that, you know, one guy calculated that if you divide the height of the pyramid into twice the side of the base, you get the number close to pi. And then he just sort of works all these different numbers, mm. so therefore it's cosmically significant. Well, Richard Hoagland was like the best example of yes, that, right? Hoagland. He would find these patterns in right. Mars and like and claim that like if you go from this rock to half the distance and like right. why would you do that? Like right. that doesn't make any sense. He would create these patterns. Right, and that's okay. I mean, all, sci all scientists look for patterns. Uh, so like just take climate change. Uh, either the earth is getting warmer, it's not either it's human caused or it's not. There's a pattern in the data. You can see the pattern. The question is, is the pattern real? So this is why uh, there, we call it, we use the term climate consensus. It's not a democracy. It's not like we voted on it and decided this is the truth. It's that independently all these different scientists working in different fields publishing in different journals come to the same conclusion so we call this consilient science or convergence of evidence science that it's not like these guys are meeting on the weekends going boy we got to combat those you know those crazy right-wingers with our data they're independently coming to these conclusions so that lifts our confidence that yeah there's probably something to their theory such that there's now so much data converting to this, you'd have to deconstruct every one of those independent lines. Um, so then you have things like um, what I call the, the problem of the residue of anomalies. In any field, there are, are residue of anomalies we can't explain. So like UFOs, for example. Uh, ufologists, and me, a skeptic, agree that 90 to 95 percent of all the UFO sightings are explained by natural phenomena. Venus, swamp gas, airplanes, 
geese, whatever. They, they know that. And so we're really only talking about 5%. Like, how do you explain that one right there in 1967 on June 3rd? It, you know, I don't know. No one knows that one. And then from there, they build, well, that's my case. And you, right. if you can't explain that, then I, I have a case. No, no, no. Well, we, that's very different than what we're talking about how, here. Yeah, though, how, right? is that, how is actually, that relevant no, to us here? It's totally relevant because I think almost all of your um, argument is based on this residue of anomalies, uh, what we call the God of the gaps argument. If you scientists can't explain, you know, this particular rock right here or that particular petroglyph, then I'm going to count that toward my compilation of data to support my hypothesis of a lost civilization. But um, no one is saying that the scientists can't explain it. What, what essentially, particularly Randall with this series of images has shown, is that what you have here is something that can be explained by rapid rapid melting of the ice caps. And Randall, step in, if you will. Well, well, well just... But, okay, but, go ahead if you want. Well, they do say, I mean, it depends what you mean by rapid. You know, I mean, a glacial dam that, as our geologists will tell us in a moment, that that breaks, that's fairly rapid. Mm -hmm. Back in 96, there was a very popular book called uh, The Noah's Flood. This was a serious book by two geologists that said uh, it was the um, rapid filling up of the Black Sea that swamped over the civilizations living on the uh, edges of this, and that that's where the no Noachian flood story comes from. Okay, mm -hmm. so it was, it was widely debated and so on, and since it hasn't fared that well. And, but that's fairly rapid. I mean, we're talking over the course of weeks or months or years. Uh, to a geologist, you know, thousands of years is rapid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, you know, an, an impact by a comet it happens in an, a couple of hours or a couple of days or weeks versus a couple of months or years. What do we mean by rapid? Okay, well, what are you saying then? Okay. So what are you saying about their theories in particular? Okay, so the problem, I think, Graham, the, the deepest problem is, is it, much of your theory depends on negative evidence. That is... I don't accept the mainstream explanation for the pyramids, the Sphinx, the Machu Picchu, whatever. Well, let's not talk about that. Let's and, just talk about this specific subject because it's going to take a long time just to yeah, cover okay, all right. so I'll asteroidal just hit, hit, impacts. Hit the, yeah, all right. So my final point is, is the falsifiability one. That is, uh, what would it take to refute your hypothesis? Like, for me, the answer would be, like, if Gobekli Tepe turned out to be what you think it might have been, the place where advanced ancient civilization once inhabited or they used it. Where are the metal tools? Wh where are the writing, the, the examples of writing? Perhaps a decision where was made not to use metal. Perhaps a decision was made that uh, errors had taken place, that, that, that in reinventing civilization we shouldn't perhaps go down quite the same route as before. Uh, perhaps writing isn't always an advance. Uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, an oral tradition which which records in memory, which enhances and uses the power of memory, may be a very effective way of of, of dealing with information. We regard writing as a as an advance, and I can see for lots of reasons why it is an advance. But if we put ourselves into the heads of ancient peoples, maybe it wasn't. I mean, there's a tradition from ancient Egypt that the god Thoth. God of Wisdom was the inventor of writing, but we have, we have a text in which he is he is questioned by a, a pharaoh who is who is saying, well, actually, have you really done a good thing by introducing writing? Because then the words may roam around the world without wise advice to to put them into into context. And what will happen to memory when people? So so there might be a choice not to not to okay, go that way. All right, but but then what do you mean by advance? When you say there used to be a lost, advanced civilization before. 10,000 years ago. Well, let's just what pause here for a second, because what, what we know for a fact is that the carbon dating in all the area around Gobekli Tepe is somewhere around 12,000 years. Is that correct? 11,600 years ago okay. is, is so, the earliest they found so far, but a great deal of Gobekli Tepe is still underground. Right. So at least what we know is someone built some pretty impressive structures 11,600 yeah, yeah. years ago. 7,000 years before Stonehenge. So when, when that story broke, this is l long before you you came along with your book, uh, it was controversial in the sense that we thought hunter-gatherers <coughs> could not do something like this because to do that you need a large population mm -hmm. with a division of labor and so forth. And, and so what the, the response to archaeologists was, well, I guess we were wrong about hunter-gatherers. Maybe they can do more stuff than we gave them credit for. So why is that not a reasonable hypothesis versus they were, it was actually advanced, but we mean something completely different by advanced, not writing and metal and technology. We mean 
I don't know what you mean. What do you mean? Well, I mean, we have, we have a body of archaeology which goes on for decades, which is <clears> saying <throat> that uh, megalithic sites, for example, Gigantia in Malta or Hagarim or Menaidra, megalithic sites uh, date to no older than five and a half to 6,000 years old. G G Gigantia would push it close to 6,000 years old. And there, there are no older sites than that. And that therefore, the, the megalithic site is associated with a certain stage of Neolithic development. Then along comes Gobekli Tepe, 7,000 years older than Stonehenge. Incredibly sophisticated site, very large scale. I mean, Klaus Schmidt, sadly, he's passed away. I, I spent three days working the site with him. He was very generous to me. He showed me a lot. He talked to me a lot. And he said basically 50 times as much as they've already excavated is still, is still under the ground, that there's hundreds and hundreds of giant stone pillars that they've identified with ground penetrating radar. He's not even sure if they're ever if they're ever going to excavate them. But by all accounts, we are looking, if we take what's still under the ground into account, we're looking at the largest megalithic site that's ever been created on Earth. And it pops up 11,600 years ago with no obvious background to it. It just comes well, out of nowhere. We, now, to me, that's, that's rather, pu well, that we know of. But to me, that's, a, that's immediately a rather puzzling and an interesting situation. And I would be remiss as, as an author and an inquirer into these matters if I didn't take great interest in that. The sudden appearance, 7,000 years before Stonehenge, of a megalithic site that dwarfs Stonehenge, to me, that's a mystery. And it's really worth inquiring into. We well, love to mystery, put it into yeah. perspective, that's more than 2,000 years older than what we now consider to be the building of the Great Pyramid of Giza. In, com in comparison to us to then mm -hmm. so between mm -hmm. our time now in 2017 and the construction of the Great Pyramid you're talking about 2,000 years earlier than that I mean that is mm. unbelievable when you're talking about 7,000 years before what we thought mm. people were doing yeah. okay but but my point was that instead of before we go down the road of constructing a lost civilization that was super advanced but different from our idea of advanced, why not just attribute to these fully modern hunter-gatherers who had the same size brains we have and so on, that they were able to figure out and do this. We just underestimated their abilities. But why did archaeologists tell us for so long hunter-gatherers couldn't do it and we needed agricultural well, populations that could generate well, surpluses that could pay for the yes, specialists to... Yes, that was to the theory. But that was, uh, so now what archaeologists are saying, was, I guess we were wrong about hunter-gatherers. Well, yeah. they might be wrong about hunter-gatherers or there might be another civilization that they had not discovered that has been unearthed oh, by time. Okay, but After, uh, sorry, Michael, lost, so lost, si lost civilizations are not such an extraordinary idea. I mean, nobody knew that the Indus Valley civilization existed at all until some railway work was done around Mohenjo-Daro in, right. in 1923. Suddenly, a whole civilization pops up out of the woodwork that's just never been taken into account before the 1920s. We still can't read its script, you know. The, the idea that we, that we come across that another turn of the spade reveals information that causes us to reconsider not just was it hunter-gatherers or agriculturalists, but perhaps something bigger than this is involved. Or in between that's, that. That's not, that's not such an extraordinary idea. I get it that mainstream archaeology doesn't want to go there, but that's my job no, to go there. I don't think that, that that's correct. They, mm -hmm. they would be happy to go there if there's evidence for it. By what you just said, they now fully accept the Indus Valley civilizations. How did that happen if they were dogmatically closed-minded? And, and, I don't and, say that and, they were dogmatically uh, closed-minded about that. The evidence, the massive amount of evidence that came up with the discovery of Mohenjo-Daro, Harappa, Dolavira, and other, and other such sites, it's very difficult. You have to be completely stupid to, to, to say that that's not a civilization. Gobekli Tepe is a bit more nuanced. You know, we have, stone, we have stone circles. We have some interesting astronomical alignments. The world's first perfectly north-south aligned building. Maybe. No, definitely. Again, that's a patternicity thing. Like, well, I'm citing Klaus Schmidt. I, you know. I am, well, that's all right. But I, uh, any of us who read back into history... 10,000 years ago, what we're thinking, that they might have been thinking, that's always a dangerous for anybody, not, not, not just you, all that's of us. That's a good point. Who's Klaus Schmidt? Klaus Schmidt was the original excavator of Gobekli Tepe. He was the, the head of the German Archaeological Institute dig at Gobekli Tepe. He kindly spent three days showing me uh, a, a, around the site. And, and really nobody's disputing the astronomical alignments of Gobekli Tepe. They weren't particularly interesting to Klaus Schmidt, but they're there. And what is the alignment? Like, how is it established? Well, when you have a, a perfectly north-south north -south aligned structure, perfectly north-south, to true north, not magnetic north, then you are dealing with astronomy by definition. And there are other alignments of the stone circles. True north as established today or with the procession of the equinoxes? True north is always about true 12th. north. Okay. It's the rotation axis of our planet. 
Okay, so it, it to this day it points exactly in the same place where it was pointing. It always points to true north. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but back to this, you know, they don't want to go. Sure, they want to go there. They would happy be happy to go there. Case in point: two weeks ago, in the journal Nature, the most prestigious scientific journal in the world, there was published an article that humans or maybe Neanderthals lived in San Diego area 130,000 years ago. This is an order of magnitude older than the Clovis date. This of was 13, the mastodon bones they found that were mastodon smashed. Mastodon bones, yes. They so, so here's an example of how, okay, so clearly there's not some conspiracy to keep alternative people or fringe or, or radical theories out. It was published in peer-reviewed, the most prestigious journal in the world. There it is. And then ago. what happened? Well, what, hasn't, hasn't there been a massive reaction to that and lots of lots of scathing remarks by other of, academics? Yes, yes. That's how, but that's normal. That's how yes. science works. Yeah. You get you get pushed back. It's you got to have a thick skin. It's just the way it goes. You got to have a thick skin. That's that's for sure. But maybe sometimes your skin is so thick that you just can't sense anything around. Well, you. of course, we don't want that either. I mean, so, what want, do you we, think is going on when you look at something like Gobekli Tepe that's covered, covered up purposefully, right? Yeah, yes, deliberately ago? buried. Again, I cite Klaus Schmidt. He, he's the authority on this. He's the excavator. He absolutely adamantly insists that that site was deliberately buried and finally covered with a hill, which is what Gobekli Tepe means in the Turkish language, pot-bellied hill. Yeah. And the, you're talking about something. Give me the perspective of how large they believe it is currently, as of current... What's excavated at the moment is on a scale of Stonehenge. What's under the ground may be as much as 50 times larger. Jesus. But, but at Gobekli Tepe, there, no one lived there. There's no tools. There's no... Well, you're talking about 12,000 years old, though. But if it's buried, it should be, there should be pottery. There's no pottery, no writing, no articles of clothing. No one lived there. Well, you're saying nobody lived there, so why should they have pottery? Why should pottery be in the fill? But, but why, would they go, about, why would they go along and break some pots and stick it in but, the artificial but how fill? how about something? <sighs> they're trash. When they, something that would indicate it's different, a different kind of people than what we're used to seeing yeah. in the archaeological record. Well, in other words... <laughs> Well, it's in, just in rubbish words, that they poured in. It's just stones and earth, it, buckets it, of it. it. In other words, Graham, for, for you to gain uh, support for your theory amongst mainstream archaeologists, they want to see positive evidence to overturn the old theory. In other words, the burden of proof is on the person challenging the mainstream. I in, completely in, in, agree. In every field. But isn't there some proof that the, the, the mainstream idea of these hunters and gatherers never had anything in what the theory was that would indicate these people were capable of building something even remotely the size of Gobekli Tepe. Yeah, to me, that's the stunning beauty of this find. It, it overturns our ideas of primitive hunter-gatherers that could not do this. Apparently, they can. It, so, that's one so this possible is, yeah, assessment. That's right. So this, I call this, somebody else called it, the bigotry of low expectations. You know, it's like we had this kind of low expectations for these hunter-gatherers. Maybe we should jettison that idea. And in my own other field of the history of religion, it also threw that off because this apparently was a, a kind of a spiritual religious. That's the wrong word. They wouldn't have used. Actually, nobody like that, can. Nobody can know that. that that's right. So, but if it was, this is the, the big National Geographic article emphasized that maybe this is the very first religious spiritual temple ever built because they didn't live there, so they went there but for a reason. Isn't it also possible that this is signs that civilization was more advanced twelve thousand years ago than we thought? Okay, more advanced. What do we again? What do we mean by? We're advanced? talking about the ability to be, the, the, to construct an amazing structure. Well, okay. The, how big was it? Like with, how with, tall were these with, with stones? Some of them are twenty feet tall. Yeah, but some but, of them are smaller with 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 uh, astronomical alignments. Klaus Schmidt called it a center of innovation. He was intrigued by the way that agriculture emerges around Gobekli Tepe at the same time that Gobekli Tepe is, is, is created. I mean, he, he went on record with me. Perhaps he's not right, but he went on record with me as saying that was the first agriculture. These were the people who invented agriculture. Now to me, the notion that a group of hunter-gatherers wake up one morning and invent megalithic architecture, the world's largest megalithic site, and at the same moment invent agriculture, stretches credulity a bit. And I think I would prefer to propose, and I have proposed, that what we're looking at is evidence of some kind of transfer of technology, that people came into that area who had other knowledge, and that that was applied. And perhaps they mobilized the local population around this site. Perhaps that's precisely why we see agriculture developing there. So perhaps that's the skill that's being passed on. But, but I don't see anything particularly... Sp okay, the stone work is spectacular, but that, that's not any more advanced than... A few cent a few millennium afterwards. But you're talking about something 20 feet but, tall, but, but made we, of stone. We, but we know a by couple people hundred, that were hunter gatherers. But a couple hundred people can move multi 
ton stones. There's no mystery in moving the stones. They're still right, moving right. 20 ton stones in Indonesia today. Yeah, I mean, megalithic cultures still exist. Right. You also know that the carving on the outside is extremely complex. It's three dimensional carving. Okay, but I mean, but you know that okay, means. But, Lasko, but do you know what that means? But Lasko at thirty thousand years ago has magnificent cave paintings with three dimensional right, but that's animals. Paint, but that's painting. You know well, that they. But, 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 but the, do you know, hold on a second. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying when I say three dimensional carvings? Yeah, like the the Venus. The no, Milo. the carvings were on the outside, meaning yeah. they didn't carve them into the rock. They carved away the rock right, around them, right. which is pretty sophisticated stuff for hunter gatherers. And they're doing this on these twenty foot tall stone columns. I mean, it's pretty impressive stuff. Okay, but th there the assumption is that they, they couldn't have figured this out. We know from modern societies where, say, Australian Aborigines, uh, in one generation, they go from stone tools to flying airplanes. The brains are quite capable of doing these amazing things. Did they go from stone, stone tools to no, no, flying but, airplanes without somebody introducing exactly. them to airplanes? Yeah, you, you're actually making his argument for him. No, no. <laughs> it's not that much of a reach to carve stone. It, it, people have been carving stones but for thousands of years. But the entire archaeological opinion on megalithic sites for decades before this was precisely that it was beyond their ability right. to do and, that. And now the mainstream has changed its okay, mind about let's, this. Let's or at the very least, a little said, shift. They, they, let's they pause said, for a moment. Yeah, let's right. pause for a moment. So for sure, we all agree human beings made this. Yes, not yes. aliens. Okay. Even so he, he the rejects argument, the aliens. So the <laughs> argument is not whether or not aliens made it. The argument is whether or not humans made it that were sophisticated. <clears throat> well, they're clearly sophisticated enough to make this incredible structure that is, is some sign of some sort of civilization. I, mean, I believe so, yeah. It, it is. Yeah, it's and, a and gigantic here I structure. I, here I agree with Graham that we've, we've uh, again, undersold who these people were. My friend Jared Diamond goes to Papua New Guinea. He talks at the, in the opening chapter of Guns, Germs, and Steel how smart these people are that live out there in nature, and what it takes to survive. Oh, he, sure. He wouldn't last an hour. You know, from L.A., he wouldn't last an hour with his Papua New Guinean friends out there in the, in the wild. Well, that's and, just and that, because he doesn't know how to survive, and they've been and, and passing they do, down right. the information right. for so generation the, after very, generation. They're very smart. Okay, so it's not, sure. a, it's not a problem of intelligence. And is there, uh, okay, so here's the other thing we don't know, is that there might be lots more of these sites and, and where there's... there's there a, are. A, I visited yeah. one of them, Karahan Tepe. You've got, you've got the T-shaped pillars sticking out the side of a hill in a farmer's backyard. I mean, I, I think we're actually at the beginning of opening up this inquiry, not at the end of it by okay, any so but, means. But then before you, before, okay, why not just say, we don't know. This is a spectacular mystery and leave it at that. Right? Why write a book that well, says, you guys on I'm going to fill in all the gaps. You guys on the mainstream side won't speculate and won't explore I don't claim to be an archaeologist. I'm not a scientist. I'm an author. It's my job to offer an alternative point of view and to offer a coherently argued alternative point of view. And I must say, Gobekli Tepe strikes me as a gigantic fucking mystery and a mystery that is worthy of exploration from a point of view that may not satisfy you. Oh, well, it does, you don't have to satisfy me. You and uh, your, you and your <laughs> colleagues. And I, don't, I, but, don't, but, I certainly don't have to satisfy you or them. That's but, not but, my project. But like your opening chapter with Schmidt, I thought I really loved the, um, the, the kind of conversational style you had with Schmidt in the book where he's dialoguing, where Schmidt goes and look at this. And then he says, but, but, but what, wait, what's that again? Now? It's like a little bit like Columbo. Like, wait, wait, I have just one more, just one more question. And, you know, the mystery kind of thickens. That's perfectly okay. That's great. I mean, mm. that's that's what science is all about: is uncovering mysteries that we then have to figure out. So there's always more mysteries, mm. but that doesn't mean that's not positive evidence in favor of a particular theory like a lost civilization. It's just we can't explain this. Full stop. Yeah, we certainly can't explain it, and you can't explain it by saying that we underestimated hunter and gatherers either. Well, why not? We know they made it. Whatever you want to call them. Well, we know humans made it. That's right. We know humans but, made it. But so whatever the, you want to call why, them. But uh, why do they believe that people were only hunters and gatherers 12,000 years ago? It's because they didn't have any evidence to the contrary. Right. This is evidence to the contrary. I agree. So you agree that there weren't hunter and, hunter and gatherers. Okay. But there's, there's several stages in between. Just, you know, 12 people living out in the jungle by themselves versus... Sure. Us, you know, there's like a whole bunch of different... Well, I would uh, say that Gobekli Tepe is a gigantic 
stage. Well, we don't. Okay, they didn't live there, so we we have to figure out what well, where where were they living and what was there. So that that has to be excavated. Well, they only excavated ten percent of it. Right? And meanwhile, and meanwhile, what you're saying is that we shouldn't speculate at all because I mean, mainstream archaeology Speculate, is speculating. No, speculating. Mainstream archaeology is speculating okay. when saying it's definitely was hunter gatherers who did this. That's also that a speculation. That seems more of a reach. Okay, but not okay. It may, they, they may be more than hunter gatherers. They they may have been partially settled. There's you can have any kind of number of states. But like, what you can't apparently have is the possibility of a transfer of technology from people who were really masters of that technology already okay, but, when they but, came in. But where are these people? Where's where, well, you're dealing with where, an incredible. Where are their homes? Twelve thousand years ago, well, their fingerprints are there. Let's find their homes. I don't know. I don't know that their homes matter. Would their homes even survive after twelve thousand years? Well, homes. I'm not sure. They're trash. But what they're survives? Tools. They're something. Well, what? Screw trash, trash and tools. We've got Gobekli Tepe. It confronts us. It challenges the mainstream model. I think it's reasonable to consider the possibility that there was something more than just hunter-gatherers involved here in creating this extraordinary place. Okay. And that's all I've done. It seems to me that to, to say hunter-gatherers could build this, I wouldn't be opposed to the idea that they're hunting and gathering but it does certainly imply a lot of leisure time. Yes. A lot of oh, leisure time. Well, and we know hunter Oh, sorry. It's okay. It's like... Well, again, if we place this back particularly within that, that climate zone at 11,006 to 12,000, 13,000 years ago, whatever it turns out to be, we're dealing with a, an extremely demanding and challenging climate. Which, which wouldn't necessarily, to my mind, be conducive to the emergence of a settled culture that would be capable of undertaking a project on this scale. And as somebody who's built a lot of things and moved quite a few heavy weights in my time, um, I, I find it the, the idea sort of um, perplexing to me that they would be, what I, what I would have to ask is what is their motive? What is their motive for undertaking a project on this scale? Because it's an enormous project. And to move a 20 ton block of stone is really a challenging task to undertake today today well without without you know uh you know the infrastructure of 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 large uh machines and so forth um but to do it by hand it, it would be an enormous undertaking and and i you know to me it's like when are they having time to hunt and gather when you're engaged in a project of this scale but, but we know hunter-gatherers have way more free time than modern society people do. That's the one thing we've learned is that it's, it's a pretty good way to make a living, actually. They have a better varied <coughs> diet than we have. This is the, you know, the Neanderthal diet, right? They have a better varied diet and a lot more free time. Yeah, but that's... Well, and a lot, more, a lot less stress. We knew that so, all along about hunter-gatherers right. when we were saying they couldn't build megalithic sites. But we're, we're, we're so looking at a time, time, time to do it. Where, where the environment is undergoing rapid changes to which adaptations would be extremely challenging. And we know those changes are going on all over the planet. We know that sea levels are ra rapidly rising over a period of a few thousand years, from, from a uh, sea stand low of about 400 feet up to the present level. We also know that, that biotas were shifting dramatically all over the planet. The, the, the effects of the Younger Dryas were global. Pretty much that is, I think, the emerging consensus now, that, that both hemispheres, north and south, were being affected by the climate changes of the Younger Dryas. So, what we're doing is we're placing this, this phenomena, this, this project within this context of these extremely challenging times in which, you know, adaptation to the environmental changes could easily be the, the all-consuming challenge of the times. I, I'm just finding it difficult to imagine a, a disconnect, to, to see this disconnect between a project of this magnitude and the motive for doing it during a time when obviously the environment could be posing serious constraints upon people's ability to function in that well, Randall, we don't even know the motives of the Easter Islanders and, no, and we why don't. they ra ra raised these huge... But we know they did it. But and, isn't and, that and, become and, a central question, though? What Something had to have motivated them. But the, let's get back Clearly. to Debekli yeah. Tepe. So, we, so let's just be real clear. We know they're humans. We know that it's at least 12,000 years old. And we know that the real dispute here, the real question is, did these people have structures and did they have agriculture? We know that they were human beings. 
They were essentially modern human beings. So were they hunter-gatherers, or did they have structures well, and agriculture? Before Gobekli Tepe, they didn't have structures and they didn't have agriculture. But After Gobekli Tepe, they did. Yeah. So the yeah. fact that yeah. they were able to build something so monumental, what kind of a leap is it at all to think that these people could figure out how to plant food and figure out how to make a house? Well... I mean, again, if you look back 30,000 years, 40,000 years to these cave paintings, these are pretty sophisticated. Yeah. Beautiful. They are. Clearly, they had abstract reasoning. They could think from the concrete to the abstract and so on. It's not a big reach to go from that to uh, moving stones around. I'd say there's a big difference between painting and engraving on yeah. cave walls. I and, don't think and, so. And I mean, to and me, the painting and, is even sorry, more Sorry, and creating the largest megalithic site that's ever been built on earth wait a minute i think there's a bit, huge difference between those two i mean nobody would compare the construction effort on on stonehenge or, or gigantia with with cave paintings i agree with you the cave paintings are magnificent i've had the privilege to visit many of the painted caves stunning work and as picasso said when he came out of Lascaux, we have invented nothing right i mean they right. were this that was that modern human mind symbolic mind at, at right. work there but this is another matter this is a large-scale construction project that's going on and it's not just a construction project it's not like huts it's hundreds and hundreds of very very large megalithic pillars which have to be mobilized brought to the place you know organizing a workforce uh, in order to do that even that requires preparation and time and learning and practice it's not something that you wake up one morning and just can do overnight you think that the paintings are more impressive than Gobekli Tepe yeah or at least comparable yeah, I, think that's, to, I but, think that's absolutely because ridiculous. To, to, to convey three-dimensionality on a 2D uh, plane, that, uh, that's what Picasso meant. It's like, wow, that's incredible. It's like developing perspective. And to use the natural shape but of it's the just, walls it's, but it's not, to create a three-dimensional perspective look, is it, that's pretty abstract. You're comparing is, apples and pears. It's not yeah. a construction project. Okay, so it's, it's it's not, I don't think it's don't even have to remotely. Compare them. But yeah. I don't think it's even remotely but what impressive. What I'm saying is that it, it doesn't take a huge leap of the imagination to think these people were pretty smart. They had well, we know that they, they were smart. Like we know what they were smart no, just because of the fact that those construction projects were done by who? By whoever. We know that they were smart. Whoever built Gobekli Tepe was clearly intelligent. Whoever made those 3D carvings, hey. clearly they were intelligent. But to think that someone drawing on cave paintings is more impressive more than impressive. erecting 20-foot stone columns yeah, okay. with three-dimensional carvings on them of a lot of animals that weren't even native to the, to the region. That's, uh, so, yeah, is that's that debatable? not necessarily the case. Because no. yeah. they could have been... No. Yeah, the, the animals were native to, But my point, uh, Joe, region. is that these paintings are like, say, 30,000, 40,000 years old to Gobekli Tepe. So there's tens of thousands of years to develop more that we that we're uh, very likely to find more archaeological uh, but, sites. Uh, and yet, yeah. up, up till, up till now, we haven't found that. We haven't, we haven't found all of that intermediate material. Which sees, See, if I, if I could actually see that intermediate material between the Upper, upper Paleolithic Cave art and Gobekli Tepe, if I could see the gradual evolution and development of skills, I wouldn't need to invoke uh, a lost civilization, the survivors yeah. of a lost civilization who've mastered those skills elsewhere to come in and teach those skills at Gobekli Tepe, but it still looks to me like a transfer of technology unless you can show me that evolutionary process whereby I can understand how this group of hunter-gatherers became equipped to create this giant site, where they practiced, where they learned the skills to move the stones, to organize the workforce, to feed and water the workforce in a rather dry place. All of that is actually quite a logistical challenge. Yep, and obviously somebody met it somehow. Some humans. Yes, right. So the right, real question right. is, did they have structures? Did they have agriculture? Did they have some sort of probably, a community where they lived in an established location? Like I, would, I would imagine so. So that would push back the time where we thought that there was a civilization. That would push them back into a realm of at least ste stepping out of the hunter-gatherer stage. Now, correct? your guy Schmidt, as you show in your book, he, he did not go as far as you, you go. Certainly not. Right. No. Uh, but he admitted it's a mystery. Okay, why, that would be the scientific approach. I don't know what it is. Great mystery. Let's just wait and see. Versus, uh, I'm going to postulate a, a lost civilization. Nothing wrong with that, Graham. Mm. It's a free country, uh, and scientists do this all the time, as as you've mentioned. <coughs> there's so, a, so there's a rather humorous thing, which I have to say. Actually, I might even ask Jamie to pull up the um, the uh, couple of images of uh, fingerprints of the gods. That's the book I'm best known for. Uh, and when I uh, published Fingerprints of the Gods in 1995, essentially I was saying civilization is much older and much more mysterious than we thought. And I was ridiculed for proposing that. 2013, one of the magazines that ridiculed me, New Scientist magazine in Britain, publishes as a cover story 
picture of Gobekli Tepe and the headline, civilization is much older <laughs> and okay. much more mysterious than, right, we, fair enough, than we thought. Fair enough. Okay, fair enough. And, 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 and scientists do do this. I mean, I've followed <clears throat> paleoanthropology for my whole adult life. And one of the big mysteries is how did we get a big brain? How did we get to abstract reasoning from, from say, what chimps can do? No one knows. The doubling of the human brain it, size yeah, over we, a period uh, okay. of two million years, And right? because no one knows, uh, every couple of years there's a new book out. It's climate change. It was... The throwing uh, arm, the, cooking that's food. That's right. Cooking meat. You know, mm -hmm. meat is another big one. A Harvard perfect meat. Okay. And these books come and go. And some of them have legs. Some of them don't. And it, it's just the way it goes. And, and then there's Terrence McKenna's It's pretty theory. obvious it was psychedelics. Yeah, that's <laughs> Terrence McKenna's <laughs> Not that made the brain theory. bigger, but that... Switch yeah. the brain. Oh, is this on. the old Julian? Um, the uh, tr Julian Jaynes? No, no, the bicameral mind. Not at all. This is David Lewis Williams, who's professor of anthropology at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. His neuropsychological theory of cave art. Uh, all kudos to Terence McKenna and Food of the Gods. He, what a brilliant thinker. What a brilliant alternative thinker. But David Lewis Williams at the University of Witwatersrand had been working on this problem since 1973. And his, his argument is that the remarkable similarities that we see in rock and cave art all around the world uh, are explained that we're dealing with a shamanistic art. Shamanism involves altered states of consciousness. This is typical visions of altered states of consciousness. And it seems to have accompanied a great leap forward in human behavior. As and you does, covered this in your book. I covered it in Supernatural. Supernatural. Yeah. As did uh, you know Richard Wrangham's theory. He's this is a highly regarded um, scientist at Harvard. So he's the meat eating guy. That mm -hmm. you know, it's right. cooking meat. Right. That, that, so by cooking the protein, that's what gives you the energy to build a huge brain. All right. So now this guy is starting with ten ten pluses on his side. He's Harvard and already respected, right. and. Even so, his book was like, eh, maybe. Well, it's probably a series of different events and a bunch of different factors. Be. That's right. It could be a number right. of different things. So let's get away from Gobekli Tepe and ancient civilizations, and let's get back to the geological evidence, which, Randall, you're an expert at. And this is one of the main things that you had a dispute with, and this is one of the reasons why we got everybody together. Now, what are what is your thoughts on what Randall and Graham proposed, specifically Randall, who is much more on the geological side of things. Yeah. Well, this is why I, I brought in my phone a friend, right. a geologist. So but by way of background, after your show, I thought, you know, this, let's just give this a fair hearing. This is what we do. So this will be our cover story, and I think the end of summer issue comes out. We're only Sorry. quarterly. I We're hope up. that Mark Defant is going to be doing some more work on the draft of his article for you that is up online because that article is full of bullshit statements about me which are demonstrably false. Well, he, he's on. Yeah, he's so there, he, and I'm can, happy to, I'm happy to engage what with those, with those particular issues. Well, I'll have to put on my reading glasses. And, and that, whatever article's online, this has not been published yet. Well, so it, claims, it claims that it's a draft of the article that will appear in a two, 2017 edition of Skeptic Magazine. So pull it up, Graham, and, and sure. give Why don't you we a chance Mark to have your time and, uh, in court. Yeah. Let's let Graham uh, go over it first, so, and then uh, we'll have Mark on so to refute what he said. So here's the on magicians of the gods. And by the way, Michael, I mean, you say that you're here to, you know, to respectfully aim to get at the truth. Yeah. There it is, uh, conjuring up me, a lost civilization from yeah, nothing. Yeah, let me, let me just um, get to the top of this. Uh, I've got it here. Just bear with me a second. So... Amongst the words in Mark Defant's article, uh, he is accusing me of duping the public. He's saying that I'm public enemy number one. He's accusing me of arm waving. I admit I do wave my arms. Uh, pontificating. Well, my grandfather was a minister of the church. Uh, little interest in peer reviewed research. Claimed that no academic would debate. That's utter bullshit. I had a debate with Zahi Hawass. He's a leading Egyptian Egyptologist. Back in 2015, it was not my fault that Zahi Hawass walked out on that debate. I can play the video if you like. A minute and a half of Zahi Hawass lambasting me and then walking out and refusing to debate further. So it's bullshit to say I don't debate or I'm not willing to debate. And finally, he says that I'm conning a hellacious number of people into buying his books. Now, how can we get any dialogue going when somebody begins like that? And okay. Then would you like some further? Bear with me, because I just have to scroll down and I don't have a mouse. <laughs> I don't have a mouse. So Hancock and Carlson claimed that several times that acad no academic would debate them. Not true. Um, uh, I'm accused of doing a, an about face. Uh, since uh, 
uh, since Fingerprints of the Gods. Are my, I mean, are my views not allowed to evolve uh, with, with new evidence? Is that somehow a, a well, crime on my part? Let me just finish. Yeah. Then um, a cheap shot, you know, he cites Jesus Gamara um, and, 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 and accuses me of not, real, not having the scientific knowledge to issue, deal with issues of gravitation. Now, it's true that Jesus Gamara, who is a descendant of the Incas, who has worked 70 years on the megaliths of Sacsayhuaman, whose father before him, Alfredo Gamara, worked 70 years. It's true that he's got a way out theory about gravitation. Thing is, I state in my book that it's a way out theory. Um, what I go on to say, quoted in the attack, is that, however, this isn't the part of his theory I'm interested in. Where I feel he is solidly persuasive is in his observations of the anomalous character of the monuments of the Andes, etc., etc. Defant doesn't cite that. He just presents me as buying what Jesus Gamara says. I mean, if that's the standard that you're going to have in Skeptic magazine, you have a serious problem. Uh, and then Gobekli Tepe, uh, he contends that Gobekli Tepe is too advanced to have been completed by hunter-gatherers and must have been constructed by a more advanced civilization. Well, no, that's not what I say. I say it was constructed by hunter-gatherers, but that they were advised and supported by people who had knowledge of this kind of work beforehand. How is that getting, different? Getting, well, I think it's very different. I'm not saying it was constructed by. I'm saying that a, that a group of people settled amongst hunter-gatherers and transferred some skills for them. Uh, he says that, um, he quotes me, Hancock makes the following stunning claim, quote, our ancestors are being initiated into the secrets of metals and how to make swords and knives. I do not make that claim. I'm reporting that this claim is made in the book of Enoch. That is not my claim. Then what else? Um, so you don't uh, think that's the explanation? Well, I'm, I'm being misrepresented by your author here. If he wants to represent me, if he accuses me of cherry-picking, he shouldn't cherry-pick okay, my we're, statements. We're, he should quote it in full context. We're still working on this. Let's get it right. Well, it's so out you there. Don't, you it's, don't it's, accept it's out there on the line. internet. No, well... It's, you still um, work on oh, it, but and then, it's and then here's online. A, then, here's a beautiful I, I one. Here, here's I, I didn't know it was online. Here's a beautiful one. He cites um, Klaus Schmidt um, on, the, on, on the character. Schmidt makes a salient point, almost as if he anticipated Hancock's book. Quote, fabulous or mythical creatures such as centaurs or the sphinx, winged bulls or horses do not yet occur in the iconography and therefore in the mythology of prehistoric times. They must be recognized as creations of the high cultures which arose later. Well, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. You've just been talking about the painted caves. Go to Chauvet Cave. You will see a lion man, uh, Holinstein Stadel, lion man carved out of, carved out of mammoth ivory. Go to, go to Chauvet, bison man, straddling lion woman. Her right arm is transferring, uh, is trans transforming into, a, in, into the head of a lion. <laughs> so certainly these mythical creatures did exist in the Upper Paleolithic, and it's rubbish to say that they didn't. I mean, how, how can I go on? The teapot. Oh, yeah. Okay. So he's, uh, he's taking issue with me because I suggest that the vulture on Pillar 43 in Enclosure D uh, is representing the teap teapot asterism of the constellation of Sagittarius. And he goes and gives us little things of Uncle Sam and some other thing that he shows. You know, anybody can impose any image on, on anything. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not my fault that a couple of academics who didn't even talk to me and had nothing whatsoever to do to me have published a major study in the, I quote it again, the uh, Mediterranean Archaeology and Archaeometry, a peer-reviewed journal, where they make precisely that identification. So at least I'm not alone. Uh, at least there are, there are peer-reviewed credential scholars who also agree that that figure is representing the teapot asterism within the constellation of Sagittarius. No reference to that. Um, uh, Shock's opinions were supposed to not go into the minutiae because they've already been dismissed by a study by Liritzis and Vafiadu. Far from it. That study doesn't dismiss Shock at all. None of that study was done on the body of the Sphinx itself. It was done in the Valley and the Sphinx temples. And by the way, the dates are extremely troubling. Some of them could push it as far as 3600 BC that the work was done, or as early in some cases as 1000 BC. I don't think that study proves anything and 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 so well, on so and so just forth just to clarify what you do believe then so that we don't misrepresent you uh so you don't think that the lost civilization instructed them on the use of metals i don't know i don't see evidence for that but, go but, back but why would you put that in the book then i didn't put it in the book i was quoting the book of enoch it's a huge passage on the on the book of enoch it's me not me who's saying that it's the I, book I, of enoch that's okay, saying that. i understand but but why i, I, forget, all what, I require I forget what the all i require your defant to do is to state that Hancock is citing the Book of Enoch. He didn't do that. Okay. That's, that I, I is, the, uh, what's, right, the, what's enough, the word, um, uh, disingenuous? Is that the polite word you guys use? But, 
Uh, it seems more but, than but, disingenuous. It's a, it's a character assassination. Well, but what the question is is why would what's the context of including that in your book? I forget. Well, the con the context is that actually I was I was criticizing Zachariah Sitchin. That's primarily what I was so doing. So you don't think that a lost civilization instructed the people who built Gobekli Tepe on the use of metals and tools? I see no evidence for that. I see Gobekli Tepe. I can't, I can't go say they instructed them on the use of metals and tools unless I can find evidence well, for so it. Well, so what did they do? We don't know. They generated agriculture. They okay. created a center of excellence around which a no, hunter-gatherer... Not, they, not the, they who built Gobekli Tepe. The lost civilization that advised them that you think happened. Yeah. What did they do if they... They've come through a cataclysm. They're survivors, few in number. This is my scenario. You don't have to accept it. I'm sure you don't. Uh, they settle amongst, take refuge amongst hunter-gatherers. I mean, I don't know. You're probably quite have some survival skills. I, I don't have many. I mean, if, uh, if we were to have a comet impact in the world today, which were to take out all the underpinnings of modern civilization, uh, I, I might go settle with hunter-gatherers because they're the people who know best how to That's live in, in that situation. I have situation. no survival skills. Yeah, so That's go settle amongst hunter-gatherers. But I might be able to transfer some of my knowledge to them. I might be able, I might have something that I could transfer to them. And I might have very <coughs> strong reasons why I might not choose to transfer all of it. But So, in, in other words, perhaps this is what happened. Okay, maybe. But mm. how is that different from uh, Zachariah Sitchin's that, well, the aliens advised them? Well, well that's I don't a need, lot different. It's, I think it's massively different, especially since Zachariah Sitchin has his aliens arriving here in 1970s NASA technology. Weirdly, he wrote his book in the 1970s. I mean, I don't, uh, I, 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 I don't go there. I don't make that, I don't yeah, make but, that but suggestion. Why, why I'm simply not? saying... Perhaps there's been a forgotten episode in human history. Perhaps its fingerprints are present at a number of sites around the world, but perhaps the extremely defensive, arrogant, and patronizing attitude of mainstream academia is stopping us from considering that possibility. And therefore, I campaign to get that possibility considered, and I try to do so with as loud a voice as possible. Well, you're doing it. You're doing it, man. But doesn't it but, disturb you that you, I mean, you run Skeptic Magazine and someone publishes something like that? I mean, that goes against the whole idea of critical thinking. I mean, it's, it's misrepresenting his quotes. It's well, misrepresenting his perspective, his point of view. It's, it's really disingenuous. This is one reason we're doing this, so we could get his... But why would anybody write something like that? And why would you guys publish something like that without checking the facts? We are. Uh, this was not supposed to be posted online. And why is this such is a person... Why, why it's, it's online, though. Why, How does something get online if why, it's not Why is such a person who will do that a useful uh, contributor to your side of the debate? Uh, well, one of the reasons we're here is to get your point of view exactly right. All right? So mm. you're saying that there's no evidence that any lost civilization exists... Only the, no, finger, saying that. Only saying, the fingerprints saying of their, that. their influence on later peoples we do know existed. I'm, I'm saying there are physical objects. I say Gobekli Tepe is one of them. I say the Sphinx is another. But see, this is that argument from e either ignorance or personal incredulity. I don't accept the mainstream, or I can't think of how this pyramids could have been built. Therefore, it was built by somebody else through some other technology. That's not what well, he's that's, saying. That's they're just, just post-dating it. I'm, they're just, you, you, I'm you saying know the, the Sphinx, is, the Sphinx is older. Uh, I do go with Robert Schock's argument on the geology. I'm also very interested in the astronomy of the site. And again, I have slides that I could show on this if we have, if we have time. You might want to get into Ed Krupp's uh, criticism of the Orion correlation and why he says it's up to, upside down. I can talk to you about that. You know. We do. I mean, I, I know Ed Krupp's argument about that. Mm. And that was from the 90s, I think. What's your Peter thoughts Prince. on Robert Schock's conclusions? I don't, uh, that's not something I know any, much about. Well, you well, should. That's a huge factor. It's a huge factor. Because your, it's your all Mark, about your water Mark erosion. Your Mark Defant knows about shock, well, and he rejects him on the on. basis of that paper. Yeah. And that all paper right. really doesn't date the Sphinx. It works with dating of large blocks in the valley and the Sphinx temples. There's not a single sample taken from the Sphinx. All right, then who dated it? Who dated it? Lyritzis I mean, and Vafiadu. And, and then why, why do mainstream archaeologists not accept the older date for the Sphinx? And the, and the answer <laughs> well, is because they have a whole a bunch of other evidence that points to the, the date that they think the it The answer does. Is very, to your question is very simple. Mark Lehner and Zahi Hawass put it on record back in 1992 when John Anthony West and Robert Schock first presented the rainfall erosion evidence on the Sphinx. And what Lehner and Hawass said is, 
the Sphinx can't possibly be 12,000 plus years old because there was no other culture anywhere in the world that was capable of creating large-scale monumental architecture like this. Show me one other structure that's capable of doing that. Well, they could say that in 1992, Michael, but they can't say it in 2017, not since Gobekli Tepe's if been If you don't mind, Graham, could you please, for people, so this could be a standalone thing, people could understand, what is the argument about the Sphinx, the enclosure of the Sphinx, and Dr. Robert Schock from Boston University, who's a geologist, yes. what was his conclusion? What Shock is saying is that the Sphinx and the trench out of which the Sphinx is cut uh, bears the unmistakable evidence of precipitation-induced weathering, weathering caused by exposure to a substantial period of heavy rainfall. And that is particularly pointed out in the vertical fissures in the trench. You see, the Sphinx itself has been subject to so much restoration over so many years that it's difficult for people to even see the core body of the Sphinx today. Uh, but it's these, you can see the vertical fissures even down at the back of there. That is, that is what shock counts as rainfall, precipitation-induced weathering, heavy rainfall, which is selectively removing the softer layers and leaving the harder layers in place. And the problem is we don't have that rainfall in Giza, in Egypt, four and a half thousand years ago. You have to go back much earlier to get that rainfall. That's the suggestion. So that's the suggestion by Robert Schock, yeah. independently of, yes. of your conclusions. Totally independently, else's. yeah. yeah. Shock disagrees with me on many things, as, yeah. a, as a matter of fact, uh, and, and I disagree with him on many things, but I, I think he's on the money on this. So that this alone case. would set back at least that one, I mean, it's pretty much established that the Great Pyramid of Giza was constructed about 2,500 BC, right? There's Is that, absolutely no doubt that a huge right. project went on at Giza around 2,500 BC. So your argument is the not that the whole thing was that much older, was that parts of it seem to have been from an earlier civilization, yes. or at least that civilization far, far earlier earlier than I was. Would, I would say that the ground plan, what we have at Giza, the basic layout of the site, was established in what the ancient Egyptians called Zeptepi, the first time. Uh, astronomically and geologically, I and my colleagues suggest that the first time can be dated to the period of about 12 and a half to 13,000 years ago. That, that that was when the site was laid out, because there's intriguing astronomical alignments of the Great Pyramids to the Belt of Orion. I know Ed Krupp has a completely opposite view on this and of the Great Sphinx to the constellation of Leo, rising due east, housing the sun on the equinox, the astrological age of Leo. Again, I have slides I can And that can would show align with the geological evidence that Robert yes. Schock concludes. It aligns with the geological evidence. The, the, age, of, of, the age of Leo pretty much exactly spans the Younger Dryas, as a matter of fact. And so the only argument against that at the time was that there were no other structures like that from 12,000 years Correct. ago. Correct. And, and then Krupp said that the that the Orion correlation wasn't real uh, because it was upside down. I mean, but do you want to get into that now? Well, first, um, that's not the only argument. It's that, okay, if the Sphinx is built, uh, or the layout for the whole thing is built in uh, you know, say 10, 11,000 years ago, and then, the, and then the pyramids are built, you know, 2500 BC, w what happened in between? Where are all the people, the trash, the places where they lived? Well, there's in a that bunch area. of different styles of construction, something but, like a, but, but not dated I, in between. I would what, propose, Michael, something like a monastery, which has a relatively uh, small archaeological footprint, is on the site. I mean, the idea of information, knowledge, and traditions lasting for thousands of years within a religious system shouldn't be too absurd to us. I mean, Judaism is, is, is dealing with ideas that are already best part of 4,000 years old if we go back to Ur of the Chaldees and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that's all I'm suggesting, really, that, that the idea is preserved, maintained, that the the survivors of the survi on the site, but oh, in something site. like a monastery, which is which has got a very small archaeological footprint. It is not high. Perhaps, again, one can only speculate and I think there's a lot of speculation on the archaeological side too, one can only speculate, perhaps having gone through a cataclysm, perhaps they felt to blame for this, wrongly or rightly. I mean, there are many, many traditions in which humanity's behavior is implicated in the cataclysm that takes place. And perhaps they didn't want to switch civilization on completely right there. Perhaps they, perhaps they waited, passed down the knowledge through initiates, Enough was there to create a, a mystery because it's undoubtedly a mystery that the construction of the Great Pyramids, the first huge pyramids in Egypt preceded only really by the Zosa Pyramid at Saqqara, mm -hmm. that the construction of the Great Pyramids is vastly superior to the construction of the pyramids of the 5th and 6th dynasty that follow it. And that's a little bit counterintuitive that we have this collapse in skills. One would have expected it to got better. So it sounds like the work on the pyramids started already with a level of knowledge in hand. 
Yes, but okay, so here's here's how I, I would think about that. Um, there's a lot of perhapsing and maybes because be, yes, well, so you have uh, a bunch of Egyptologists and archaeologists who have been working on th this site for centuries. This is one of the most you know ancient mysteries and so on. And and so say let's say there's like 20 lines of evidence that point to built roughly around this time period here, and then you come on and say okay, but there's this one anomaly of the rain thing that in the, there was only rain at this time now there's a huge gap you have one anomaly or line of evidence here and like 20 here well, we're talking about so, different structures though there's not a lot of evidence that points to the sphinx being from a particular time period well he's saying like 12,000 right i'm saying the rainfall evidence suggests right, that but and, other and evidence and so it's that alignment would, that and would, it's alignment with the constellation of leo housing the sun right, right. at dawn on the spring equinox it's an equinoctial market nobody would dispute that nobody would dispute mm. that the ancient egypt well no i mean if you make a monument pointing perfectly jewish i've stood on the back of the sphinx at dawn on the spring equinox and believe me again i could show a picture its head lines up perfectly with the rising sun but no i don't think anybody even krupp is disputing that it's an equinoctial marker now here's the thing you're an ancient egyptian you're building an equinoctial marker in 2500 bc do you know what constellation is housing the sun in 2500 bc i haven't run the little program well it's see. the constellation of taurus so so logically if you're creating an equinoctial and the ancient egyptians were not shy about making images of bulls plenty of them. If you're making an equinoctial marker in 2500 BC, you really should create it in the form of a bull, not in the form of a lion. You know, that's the, that's the puzzling issue. And yet we do have a time when a lion constellation housed the sun at dawn on the spring equinox. And that is the period of the Younger Dryas. Okay, I'd say that's a pretty big leap. And well, I know you'd say that, yeah, and uh, your colleagues all say uh, that too. Uh, and so now, and then we have a gap of about five or six thousand years where there's nothing. There's no. Well, let me interject there. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, please do. No, please I'm going to refer back to several articles that were published in the 80s and 90s. This one is from uh, from Nature, early 80s, late Quaternary history of the Nile, and what it's discussing is the evidence that there was a major shift. In the, in the hydraulic regime of the Nile River. Um, it says between 20,000 and 12,000 years before present, when timberline in the headwaters was lower, vegetation cover more open than today, the Nile was a highly seasonal braided river, which brought mixed coarse and fine sediments down to Egypt and Sudan. This cold, dry interval had enter, ended by 12,500 years before present when overflow from Lake Victoria and higher rainfall in Ethiopia sent extraordinary floods down the main, main Nile. And those floods have been documented to have been 120 feet above the modern floodplain of the Nile. Any civilization, or whatever you want to call it, living along the Nile River at that time would have had to abandon whatever they were doing there in, the, in this regime, this intensified hydraulic regime. And it says, it goes on to say, it marked a revolutionary change to continuous flow with a superimposed flood peak. So what happened is that there was a major environmental change that occurred right there around 12,000 to 12,500 years. The dating could be adjusted somewhat uh, since the early 80s, but the point is made is that because of a major hydrological change, major vegetational cover change, major environmental change, this would have caused also imp imposed changes upon whatever culture was existing there or living there at the time. Now what we have is in the aftermath of that event, we have basically the emergence of desert, which now would require serious adaptation. Um, it's very likely too that these events uh, could have also decimated the population at the time, leaving um, basically no workforce. And then over a period of two or three or four thousand years, you find that, that there's enough of a recovery that these kind of monumental structures can be renewed. Um, but it's clear from this and a lot of other studies, studies in the eastern Mediterranean showing that there are sap repel layers, um, which, is caused, which is basically material that has been f washed in from the continental surface that has not oxidized. It has essentially become rotten and carried in, organic material carried in off of the continents by this enhanced regime of, of water flow. Um, actually forcing so much water that there was a freshwater lid on the eastern Mediterranean that uh, caused a cessation in the, um, the, the, the circulation between the upper waters and the lower waters 
reducing the amount of oxygen brought down to the to the lower waters and so you had these layers of mud that formed on the bottom of the Mediterranean that show this massive influx of fresh water flowing off of out of the Nile and off of the the Egyptian continent at this same time so clearly the evidence shows that there were major climatic changes that occurred around this time it is not so speculative to to imagine that whoever, whatever, and we don't have to invoke any kind of a super advanced civilization, but whatever cultures were there that were perhaps capable of carving blocks of stone, transporting blocks of stone, as they were at Gobekli Tepe during this time range, would have been, that, that, their, that their activity would have been interrupted to the extent that it might have taken millennia to, to recover to get the, get the labor force necessary to undertake major mon monumental programs on the Giza Plateau. So, so I think that, that the, if we assume this gradualistic scenario, yeah, that's a fair question to ask. We're, what happened in that interval? But if there is a major climatic downturn and a major disruption of the, the settled patterns of whatever culture was already there, then you know, now we might have an explanation why there would be a gap especially if these events caused a, a, a bottleneck in the population of the area. Of course, this is all speculative, but it is not speculative to say that there is multiple lines of evidence suggesting these major, even cataclysmic changes that engulfed that part of the world during that era. So that could, that could provide an explanation of why there is a gap there. Makes a ton well, of sense. Well, it does it because... Does it not? It, only if you have to have the Sphinx in conjunction with 12,000 years ago in the lost civilization. Mm -hmm. if, if you just say the rainwater erosion oh, on the Sphinx uh, it, it is, is not an explanation for the age and that the traditional accepted age is mm -hmm. what we think it is, then there's no gap to fill. Yeah. So really all we're talking about is we have, again, lots of evidence here, one anomaly here. Mm -hmm. I really want the anomaly thing to stick, so I got to explain the gap. The gap is explained by environmental changes. Yeah, maybe but what hard, is the well, what maybe, is the lots of evidence other than a lot of assumptions? It's and all a lot assumptions. of maybes. It's well, all. I mean, actually, can you cite me a single contemporary inscription from the date that the Sphinx is supposed to have been made that refers to the Sphinx? Uh, I'm sorry. Say can that, you uh, cite uh, a single contemporary? Inscription contemporary from, from to ancient, the contemporary to the date that Egyptologists ascribe to the Sphinx. In other oh, words, to the reign of Khufu. Can you cite me a single inscription uh, that uh, talks I, about I, the Sphinx being built? Uh, this is not, uh, I, I don't study this area. I don't know. Okay, well you can't because there is no such well, inscription. Okay, well so. Well, one would have thought there would well, be. Well, maybe. It's a giant project. It's 270 feet long. It's 70 feet high. It's carved out of solid rock. Nothing. Okay, but you have no reference to it at all in the Old Kingdom. You actually have to come down to the New Kingdom to get references to the Sphinx and inscriptions. So, but you've already said that uh, the pyramids were built at the time we think they were built, not thousands of years ago. I would ago, say that right. a great deal of work was done on the pyramids at the time of 2500 BC. I have, think the ground plan was laid out earlier. And we have like the Step Pyramid, which is cruder and not as well designed as the other pyramids. Mm. That's, a, that's a transitional stage mm. at that time. Often argued to be a transitional stage. Yeah. Have you you've been yeah. to the Step Pyramid, I'm sure? No, no, no. Right. And, and you've been to Giza, though? No, I've never been to Giza. Oh, dear. Well, well, they do make a very different impact. I mean, I've climbed the Great Pyramid five times. And, well, and I, I mean, you're dealing with something orders of magnitude different in terms of what's required. I mean, this thing weighs six million oh, tons. Oh, I understand. But it's 481 feet high. It consists of two and a half million individual blocks of stone. It's aligned to true north within three sixtieths of a single degree. I mean, to compare that to Zoser uh, is really not a valid comparison at all. What's more interesting to me is the radical decline that takes place in pyramid building skills in the fifth and sixth dynasty. Go to Unas, go to Pepi, go to Teti at Saqqara. These are a shambles. You can hardly even recognize them as a pyramid. What happened to all that knowledge that's invested in the Great Pyramid? Why does Egypt devolve so rapidly? Uh, why, why, how do we explain this pristine, amazing work that's done on the Great Pyramid unless there's a legacy of knowledge being attached to it. Okay, so uh, every archaeologist, uh, e Egypt, Egyptian archaeologist and Egyptian knows everything you just said. They do. And, and they don't accept any of your arguments. Why not? That's why I'm needed, because somebody's got to well, counter I mean, are, this. Is it just that they're closed-minded and they follow uh, Zahi Avas and, and they never think for themselves? You want to see a closed mind? I'll play your one-and-a-half-minute video of or, Zahi Avas okay, refusing uh, yeah, to but, debate but, with but, me. But, but, but all of them? 
uh, every one of the Egyptologists and archaeologists uh, over the last two centuries and so on, they know, all, they're all dogmatically closed-minded and they can't see the arguments as clear as you? Or is it they're not convinced by your argument? They're not convinced by my argument. They genuinely and absolutely believe that their argument is right. The notion that I'm proposing is apparently so preposterous to them that it isn't even worthy of consideration, but it is worthy of insults and attacks uh, on me, on my integrity, on my decency as a human being, on my honesty, all of those things get attacked, you know, because mainstream, and that's fine, I'm ready for that. And I, by the way, I know that archaeologists, academics constantly attack each other all the time. I used to take this stuff personally, but then I, when I see what they do to each other, the ravaging attack dogs yeah. are let loose on, on any new idea. I sometimes wish scientists would, would actually look for what's good in a new idea rather than what's bad, oh, but well. I, I get why they do yeah. look for what's well, bad. But in other words, a gra some young graduate student working in that area could make a name for himself by overturning, uh, you know, My son was a young graduate student at the University of Cardiff studying Egyptology. He got marked down in his degree because he proposed the possibility that the pyramids and the Sphinx might be or might have older origins. Uh, he was impressed by my work. It did him a lot of harm in his degree. And, and if all this was true, uh, th then eventually you, you haven't answered it, my point. it would come you out. You haven't answered my point. Which is if what? you go against the mainstream view, your career does not progress as an Egyptologist. I, I disagree. I mean, how give me is, an example. How is it that we know anything that we know about Egyptology Give me an example now? from Egyptology of somebody who's gone against the mainstream view and been lauded for so doing. Well, look, we don't believe everything about it that we believed two centuries ago, at, say, Napoleon's time, right? How did all that knowledge come about? How did all the change in the, that science well, develop? It really begins with Champollion and the deciphering right. of the Rosetta Stone. Uh, all right. so how was he able to do he's, that against the mainstream? There was no mainstream <laughs> all right, so that he was against. My, there was no mainstream. The mainstream has taken time to form, and it's very solid now. I mean, scientists Egyptologists are, all sing from the same hymn book. You'll find very little disagreement amongst but, but them on anything. But this is true in every field. But somehow or another, Einstein managed to, to make an impact because he turned out to be right. Well, I'm no it's, Einstein, it's, and I don't it, know if it, I'm it, right, but I'm going to continue to oppose that mainstream. And, and Somebody has to. I don't to. know. That's, that's a valid comparison, Einstein and archaeology. All right. Well, take paleoanthropology. I mean, it's a completely different field now than a century ago. How did that happen if no one ever accepts new ideas? They do. It happens all the time. Well, they're being forced to accept Gobekli Tepe, and that's a new idea. That, but, but like, that, you know where you were talking about things taking a long time, and what seems like a long time to us is really a blink of the eye in, in terms of archaeology? We're in, in the middle of that. We're essentially in the middle of that with things like Gobekli Tepe, with Forbes publishing an article about the Younger Dryas possibly being impacted by comets and that being one of the causes of a mass extinction. R right. And, and when and these are all mainstream and, ideas and, now. And when Alvarez proposed the impact hypothesis for the demise of the dinosaurs in 1980, it was ridiculed. And, mm -hmm. and, but he turned out to be right, and then that became the accepted Right. It takes mainstream. time. Well, but what was the key and turning point? people are challenging that. Wasn't the key turning point the finding of the crater? That's what, that's what made yeah, the difference. Yeah, it's so kind of hard so, to argue with so that. So again, where's your crater? <clears throat> well, this is where perhaps we need to bring in our phone a friend, you know, okay. uh, Malcolm LeCompte, one of the, one of the Younger right. Dryas impact, right. uh, impact scientists. I mean, the, the point the point being made is the following. Firstly, that the primary impacts were on ice, uh, that there may have been as many as four impacts, that they were on the North American ice cap. Some craters have been suggested, for example, very deep holes in the Great Lakes. Uh, other craters have been and, and will be looked at by the team in the, in the coming months, whether it includes the Corosol crater, the Quebecia Qu Qu terrain, and so on and so forth. There are candidates. The, the crater has not been found yet, but I would be surprised if a crater was easy to find when, uh, you know, the impact is on two mile deep ice. And, you know, one of the biggest strewn fields in the world, which is the Australian strewn, tektite strewn field, there's no crater associated with that, but everybody accepts the impact proxies. There's enough of them to, to, to justify that. And that's what's going on around this impact hypothesis. So now. on a related uh, question to that is the, not the lost civilization and the demise of humans, but the megafauna extinction of North American mammals. So this has been long debated uh, uh, before the impact hypothesis was proposed. And the competing hypotheses were overhunting, humans just hunted them to the point where, not every last one, to the point where the population numbers get too low and these species can't survive. Or climate change, or both. Mm -hmm. The climate change weakened the populations, then the humans came over mm -hmm. and, and overhunted them. All right, so... 
Um, and, and then the impact hypothesis is proposed. Okay, so this was debated, and it didn't fare that well because there were a lot of uh, mammals and other species that didn't go extinct that you would expect from a massive impact like that. It would have wiped out. Why, why the selected species, the kinds of species that humans would hunt, are the ones that went extinct, whereas these others didn't? Well, well why would humans was, be hunting the again. largest I, I, there's no evidence that human humans hunted the predators. There is evidence that they hunted woolly mammoths, but it's yeah. a very sparse. I mean, you have no more than a dozen sites that show association between uh, human hunting and mammoths. And a lot of those, like the Lubbock Lake site, is now being questioned. What was presumably what was previously uh, interpreted as being butchering marks on on the, the mammoth remains there are now being reinterpreted as possibly natural marks on the on the mammoth bones. But it's a big stretch to go from, okay, we've got a dozen sites where we have mammoth remains, and along with those mammoth remains, we find a few Clovis spear points. In two or three cases, we actually find, or they have found spear points embedded within the mammoth, like in the rib, rib cage. But it's a very large stretch to go from there to say that 10 or 12 million woolly mammoths or, or four species of mammoths on four continents were wiped out by Paleo-Indian hunters, probably in bands of no more than two or three dozen. Have you ever been to a head-smashed-in buffalo site? Yes, but, but but that's a good example because nowhere did that go anywhere close to exterminating the species of American no, but, bison. But but each site has its own uh, particular explanation. Could be hunting, could be a massive flood, earthquake, whatever. They could all be have a massive different... flood, yes, exactly. Yeah. I think there you but, and but, I would be in complete agreement. What does it mean by massive? There's global versus you know local. So, for example, there's 52 mammalian genera went extinct in South America. Why would they go extinct in South America? About the time that humans were moving down there the, hunting. The, the, the Younger Dryas versus... uh, impact hypothesis includes South America. It there does. were impacts there. It does. And, and, and uh, you know, th again, the dating of the, the migration of humans into South America is controversial at this point. Um, you know, there is evidence that humans were there long before. You know, Paul Martin's idea of, of Blitzkrieg requires that the animals be so stupid that they couldn't, they, they, they had no adaptive capabilities to the uh, appearance of a new predatory species. But what, what is being demonstrated from examining the life ways of, of uh, the Paleo-Indian peoples is that they had very diversified diets, um, and they were hunter-gatherers. Um, now... Why would they be choosing the largest, most dangerous animals to hunt when they had such a proliferation of other smaller animals? We know that they were foraging. We know that they were eating seafood there was, and, and fishing um, because all of this is being found in the, in the camps. Um, and then it certainly doesn't explain the extermination of you know, the, the, the cave bears, the short-faced bears, the camelops, the, the, the giant beavers, the giant armadillos, the American Pleistocene lion, the, 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 the ground sloths that were the size of giraffes, um, four species of, of proboscideans, meaning um, mammoths, extinct on four continents. And to me, like, wait a second. We don't. We cannot. We cannot invoke a modern example to to say, well, here How is. How about the Maori? Well, that's controversial, also. Um, I mean, they drove the uh, Maori birds extinct in. in Past uh, eagle. In, 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 well, yeah. that, that's an assumption. Yeah. Yeah. That, he was, he was, if you ask the Maori it's a big themselves, between that and people with atlatls killing off all the saber-toothed tigers. But here's another answer to one of your questions. You were saying, like, why would some of the animals be alive? Well, we know that the the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago didn't kill everything. Right. Right. And that mm -hmm. is a massive impact, far bigger than anything we're talking about, and many many animals survived that. So we don't know why things survive and why they don't. It could be proximity to the impact. Right. It could be that their food source wasn't removed. It could be that their predators uh, were wiped out and they, they managed to survive. I mean, there's a lot of animals that are still that are alive today in this continent. Like, uh, for instance, a pronghorn antelope. Pronghorn antelope, uh, Dan Flores, who's a wildlife historian, uh, wrote an amazing book uh, um, uh, on it, and we, when he was talking about the uh, American savanna during, you know, like 15,000 plus years ago, they, there was all sorts of crazy animals millions of years ago that were like cheetahs that were running mm -hmm. down mm -hmm. animals at extreme speeds, which is the reason why pronghorn antelopes can run so much faster than any of their current predators.
something much faster than them was killing them, and that was wiped out. But they managed to make it. One of the reasons why they probably managed to make it is because their predators were wiped out. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not an even and another That's another right. point, Michael. Um, if it's overkill, um, it's it's intriguing that the overkill occurs, you know, precisely in the Younger Dryas window. Because I think you'd agree that now the whole story of the peopling of um, of the Americas is is pretty much up for grabs. I mean, Clovis first was the dominant model for a very long time, and under that model, we're to envisage these Clovis hunters coming in across the Bering Land Bridge going down the ice-free corridor, and then in like 800 years, with their sophisticated fluted points, they wipe out all the mammoths in, in North America. But now we know that humans have been coexisting and butchering mammoths, coexisting with mammoths for thousands of years before that, possibly tens of thousands of years before that. You mean from evidence in Siberia? I, I don't only mean from evidence in Siberia. I, I mean, I can cite you from, from Nature magazine just recently. Huge, huge number. The, I don't think the Yukon is in Siberia, is it? No. Uh, okay, I think the Yukon's in but, North America. Jacques Sank Mars, you know, the excavator of the Bluefish Caves in the Yukon, back in the 1970s were propo was proposing that human beings had been in the Americas at least 24,000 years ago. His reputation was utterly destroyed. His research funding was withdrawn. He was given no access to grants. He wasn't able to do his work. He was heavily penalized and punished by the community. And now, just a few weeks ago, we have the Smithsonian coming out and saying, sorry, we got it wrong. Jacques St. Mars was right all along. And Tom Dillahay, you know, with his work in Monte Verde, the shit that he had to take, uh, I think we're, we're in a very interesting time. The peopling of the Americas is, is really a paradigm that has absolutely been overthrown. The notion of Clovis first, well, you yeah. disagree with Smithsonian then, which is fine, I'm, I, I do no, too. No, the Mesa Verde, you know, it's an isol again, it's an anomaly, it's an isolated site. What do you, where are all the sites between Clovis and Monte Verde? Do you honestly think Clovis was still first? For, for thousands and thousands of years. Come on, Michael. And Do you think no Clovis was still first? Where are all the people between Clovis and Monteverde? Not my problem. Not, yeah, it is your problem. No, it's not my one, problem. They're yeah. there in Monteverde and they're there in North America. Okay, Go so figure. What's more likely? That Go there, figure why there's, there's, a, there's a Denisovan there's a trace in South American Indians and not in okay, North American it, it's Indians. Like the, it's like the nature paper I brought Maybe up earlier. Maybe people crossed the ocean. That, uh, that there were Neanderthals or humans in San Diego 130,000 years ago. Okay, but when you look at that, Okay, so they have mammoth bones. It looks like they might have been broken in the length, you know, mm -hmm. okay? And the tools, but they're not, okay, the tools. We're they're kind of changing take... subjects here, though. Well, no, no, no. You're, well, you're with... trying to quibble the evidence of yeah. earlier human presence. That's right. You're trying to quibble it. Well, not quibble. Just well, you're quibbling it. You're, quib you're, you're quibbling it. Okay. But what are you saying very specifically that's opposing what he just said? The reason archaeologists don't accept earlier than Clovis, say earlier than do. about 13,000, 14,000 years. They do. It's years. massively, it's massively no. accepted. Like, say, say Mesa Verde, for example. Okay, I have to bring up an image Wh at this Why don't point. they accept Mesa Verde? They do accept Mesa Verde. As, as a, it uh, is accepted Michael, now. Michael, are you sure as, about this? As what, 24,000 years? 15 plus, possibly, possibly significantly Yeah, okay, uh, so, significantly 15, older. so 15 is kind of the, the outside of the window that humans came across the Bering Strait. That's possible. Not 24,000 years. Could you open years, Clovis first? Not 130,000 years ago. Now, if it turns out that that nature paper is right and that's confirmed, then that does overturn uh, the mainstream theory for sure. But, but why yeah. would you, this is not like your field of study. Why so, would you argue against the nature so paper? Let's, let's, uh, okay, I'll just give you. I, let's I, quote I the Smithsonian. I, I ask professionals. Smith Smithsonian, this, slide number five. Today, decades later, the Clovis first model has collapsed. Okay, based on dozens of new studies, we now know that pre Clovis peoples slaughtered mastodons in Washington state, dined on desert parsley in Oregon, made all purpose stone tools that were Ice Age version of the yeah, X Act of Between 13,000, that's not. No, look at this. All it says, between no, that it says and then 24,000 years down at the bottom, Michael, you know, are you saying the Smithsonian are wrong on this? Michael, you're jumping Very to conclusions before you even read that. You want to be right so badly. You didn't read the part and other <laughs> animals me. there. Look, I don't well, hold on a, a second. Confirming that humans had butchered horses and other animals there 24,000 years ago. It says it right there, and you are arguing against it without even reading it, which means you want to be right. No. No, that's absolutely no, what's going because on. Because I have no dog in this fight. Well, why didn't you I read that care. whole thing before you started pointing you're, at you, you being correct? You published Skeptic Magazine, and you have no dog in the fight? You're asking me, why don't mainstream archaeologists accept... <laughs> you should be dates, skeptical of Clovis first. The tens of thousands... Okay, call it whatever you want. It, it goes back... 11, 13, But what do you 15. think about what that says? That there's evidence they butchered horses 24,000 years ago? Okay, I would have to check the site on that. I haven't seen this article. Well, but now that you have seen it. Not my problem. 
Okay. Now that not you have problem seen either. it, but you, you said, said, but you you because you're the there's no evidence. And you're here opposing this, and you're saying there's no evidence. You haven't even read I'm the fucking a, article. Uh, okay, I'm not opposing anything. I'm saying you certainly this are. This is the reason why scientists accept these dates here, because there's lots and lots of evidence for that. That is scientists. 10,000, 11,000, 12,000. That is that is, that is scientists. Then you, then you, say, you find one person that says 24,000. Another one, like oh, two weeks ago, that says this is not says, one person. This and, is very and, disappointing and paper, that you're you're no, arguing this without really doing any research about it. And then. And then I, I, I the just, article is titled, I What Happens When an Archaeologist Challenges Mainstream Thinking? Um, and and, 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 and this, that's this in the Smithsonian in the month of March. Okay, uh, Jack sunk Mars. It was a brutal experience. Something that sunk Mars once likened to the Spanish Inquisition. At conferences, audiences paid little heed to his presentation, giving short shrift to the evidence, etc., etc., etc. The result was always the same. When he proposed that Bluefish Caves was 24,000 years old, it was not accepted. What the Smithsonian are saying is now, this is accepted. You need to get up to speed with the data, Michael. Uh, okay, my, my archaeology friends like Jared Diamond, who I just checked with on this, who's at UCLA. Well, he certainly has a dog in the fight. And, and he... Uh, well, he just says, here's the problem. For 50 years, people propose pre-Clovis uh, examples or sites or evidence. They never hold up. They always, the dating turned out to be incorrect. The, the carbon-14 was not calibrated right. There was this, there was that. They never hold up. It's so not essentially, that, you're yeah, quoting you a friend. Yeah, you for 50 years. Well, you're quoting a friend who says the evidence hasn't held up before. Instead yeah. of quoting these articles with these scientists who are talking about the data that's showing that human beings butchered horses 24,000 years ago, you're disputing it just because you talked to a friend. I'm saying that that has to be confirmed, that particular but site. But why argue they, against it? I'm not arguing against it. You certainly it. were. No, I'm just saying that... Was this is the, this Am is I the, wrong? I, I feel you were arguing against it and saying that it's not the case and quibbling it. And you seem to be, no, no. if I'm correct, you seem to be a, a Clovis first advocate. But put your, put your reputation on the line no, and say uh, you okay, advocate Clovis gonna, first. I'm not going to put a label on it. I'm going to say in the latest evidence that, that overwhelmingly shows humans coming across uh, the Siberian Straits into North America 11, 12, 13, 14, 15,000 years ago. That they definitely did then. They definitely and, did then. And now what, did they before? What could push it back much earlier would be if they came by boat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like where I live in Santa Barbara, there are sites on the Channel Islands that go back 11, 12,000 years ago. And they came by boat. Now the problem is, is, well, if they lived on the shores, which is where the good fishing and eating is, those are underwater, and, and short of doing good underwater archaeology, which is hard to do and expensive, and most of it's probably gone, we may never know. So one of my beefs with archaeology, actually, is that 10 million square miles of the planet that were above water during the right. Ice Age are right. underwater now, and marine archaeology is still mainly looking at shipwrecks, you know. Well, it, okay, they do that because it's... It's, you know, it's like it's where, the, it's where the light is. Well, it leaves a big unanswered question. At any rate, so for, for the record, can I at least say that you completely oppose the Smithsonian's position on this? That no, there has been no, no paradigm I, shift. I will look at this. I haven't seen the Smithsonian okay. thing. All right. I'm not aware of the horse find from 24,000 years ago. I am aware of the 130,000 year date from the Nature Paper two Yeah, I have a slide ago. on that too. Uh, and, 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 and if, okay, but, well, but I think but the show major the, show speculation. The stone tools. They're nothing like Clovis points. It's just a big, like, hand rock that might have been used. It might have been random sorry a big hand rock is yeah, all there is before 13,000 years ago no I'm talking about the 130,000 year old site oh, 130,000 oh, you're year talking old about site. the San Diego we're, thing we're, yeah. we're, we don't we don't need to talk about that Why? That, that that raises interesting questions was it Neanderthals was it Denisovans was it anatomically modern humans 130,000 years ago it, it raises interesting site, questions or but, is it a but, misinterpreted site because they yeah, aren't stone tools I'm, I'm they're not just pinning, rocks I'm not pinning anything to that I'm well, just I'm, I'm I'm saying yes that report the question that is report not necessarily was in just about the stone tools it's about how the bones were shattered and they believe the bones were shattered deliberately indicating that someone was trying to get at the marrow maybe. indicating or, yeah maybe or a, a tractor rolled over it you know a couple of years no, ago no 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 well, no, 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 one the, no one had okay. excavated that's just speculation on your part immediately this no, my part this was one of the uh, 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 immediately the find the has paper. been quibbled yeah. by the archaeological mainstream of course it's been published by the Archaeological mainstream too, and the rest of the mainstream is quibbling it's it. A, we will see mystery. how that plays out. I thought out. you said that can't happen. We will say what can't happen. That the mainstream won't allow, uh, uh, you know, radical ideas. To Nature published the, it, and the, right. the idea is being quibbled. And, 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 and here uh, the Smithsonian Nature certainly so would not. It's okay. Nature certainly would not have published it if the evidence were not strong. I accept that. Nature's not in the business of publishing, you know. Fringy stuff. It's a, it is it is a radical proposal, but it's strong enough to, to justify publication in Nature. What's interesting to me is that the immediate reaction of the archaeological community is not say, well, 
What could this mean? Let's, let's look into the implications of this. I mean, if there were Neanderthals or Denisovans in North America 130,000 years ago, we have a whole new scenario building here that really should interest everyone. Instead of, instead of the first reaction is, let's destroy this because it's really annoying. Let's get rid of it. Let's prove it's wrong. Let's suggest that it was a fucking bulldozer or something like that. Maybe it was. I don't know. The work hasn't been, hasn't been done yet. But that instant sort of, uh, it's, it's almost like an immune response to, a, to an idea that doesn't fit into the prevailing paradigm. But the other work, the work in South America, the Bluefish Caves work, that's really not controversial anymore. That's very widely accepted. Clovis first is a discredited and abandoned position. And I have something else to ask you, actually, concerning genetics and, and DNA. I'm sure you're well up on that. I mean, can you explain why we have a strong signal of Denisovan DNA in certain groups of South American Indians and in Australian Aborigines and, and Melanesians. But th that Denisovan DNA doesn't crop up in North American Indians. How would we explain I that have, if they all came through the Bering Strait? I have no idea. Well, it could be boats. But, but, I mean, this just happens to be something I don't know anything about. Okay. So part of the problem of, of even doing this is that... It was your you, idea. You, well, here we are talking. This mm -hmm. is good. But part of the risk is that you, you're going to find something I don't happen to know about. And then it's like, you see, I made my point. What point? That, okay, so... In, in, in like the history of the peopling of America, that, that area, uh, there's always somebody that comes in with, it's you know not Clovis, it's this, it's that, and rarely do they last. Why? The dates were miscalibrated or whatever. It's not just that scientists are closed-minded, although they can be. It's that the convergence of evidence isn't strong enough to overturn the mainstream theory. So, but, but it does happen. Uh, you know, maybe there are multiple migrations into North America and we just don't have all the mm. sites. But when somebody comes up with a site like that's tens of thousands of years earlier than all the others that are accepted here, and it's over here, where are all the sites in between? Where's the, it's like the gap, the 5,000 year gap with the uh, Egyptian uh, complex. Where are the sites? If it's true, we, they didn't fly there. So how'd they get there? Well, and, and there must be a trail you know, uh, somewhere that we could find unless they came by boat and then that's evidence is or gone. Or unless you're dealing with 24,000 years ago and there's not much evidence to find. That maybe. But, but if then, they but, came by but, boat, but, then that clearly implies they had navigational skills. They had the ability to build boats and, and you know, find their way across the ocean. And big ocean, well, you, too. You can, you can do the coast. That, that's not oh. quite as, you don't need a, you know, big ocean going. But you no, know, you don't need an ocean going. But, I mean, you know, this is one also, hypothesis that, yeah. that, you know, that's proposed, is that they came across by, uh, by boat just following the shore. Just, the same area as the you know, Bering Strait. You, yeah, you're just yeah. 100 feet offshore. You right. go in and... and, and uh, but most likely both, right? And, and, and one of the issues, yeah, of right. course, was the uh, short-faced bear was so formidable, according to Dan Flores, that it would have been a huge impediment for people crossing on foot anyway. Mm -hmm. And the short-faced bear went extinct right around the time we see more evidence of human beings entering in. But why did it go extinct? That's the big question. Well, you have to add that to the list of, of predators that there would have been no reason for humans to have been hunting. Yeah, well, and, that's and an enormous, enormous animal. So there's sort of two, two factors that go on here. There's positive evidence in favor of a hypothesis. Then there's negative evidence against the mainstream hypothesis. And you really need both. So it's not enough to just say, uh, I don't accept the evidence for here. That, okay, that's fine. Scientists do that all the time. What evidence? What are you, well, let's, spe let's speak, speak in specifics because you keep doing this. You keep saying, well, they find things, and it turns out, no, that's not true. And then you're essentially well, the like proving thing. your point of being a skeptic without having any real cases. Well, you just uh, keep saying this. All of the cases is we're it, talking but, about. But no, you're not say, you can't say all the cases. If you don't want to cite anything specifically, don't keep bringing up things that are refuted because you don't have anything that you're pointing to. So you're just muddying the water. Okay, You're essentially pissing thing. in the pool. No, no, the Clovis thing, for example. Gobekli Tepe, the pyramids. All, all of these... What's been disproved? No, okay, I'm making a diff slightly different point. That that's the problem, that is that you're, you're not addressing the actual issues we're talking about. You muddy the water by saying things have been tossed out the window, so we have to be careful here and toss these things out the window as well. Not toss out, just contemplate them published in uh, nature for example mm -hmm. so let's watch what happens to the 130,000 year old hypothesis if it if it holds up and there's other sites that are dated that way and so on and so forth and that will be truly revolutionary and scientists would accept it they would you see the problem is that when you have a very strong paradigm like Clovis first which really dominates American archaeology prehistoric archaeology for a very long period um, it's difficult it's difficult from a career point of view for archaeologists to come up and propose alternative sites. Those who did, like Tom Dillahay, like Jacques Cinq Mars, 
paid a very heavy price for so doing. So the incentive to go looking for older stuff than Clovis is extremely low in the archaeological community as a result of this ferocious reaction that went on for 30 or 40 or even 50 years. You know, I mean, also consider the Valsequilo uh, excavations in, in, in Mexico, uh, where, where there was a suggestion of hu some sort of human presence 230,000 years ago. I mean, that good archaeology, but it was utterly dismissed and the archaeologists involved were were ruined for getting involved in that. It's hard to see how that's a profession that encourages people to think outside the box. Do, do when careers know, uh, get ruined yeah. and research funding gets withdrawn for an idea that doesn't fit the current mainstream well, hypothesis. Certainly we, we don't like to think that, that scientists do that. They do that. Are you familiar with Michael Cremo's book, Forbidden yeah. Archaeology? I, I know Michael, yeah. Okay. So, uh, now, and, and he makes, in my mind, as compelling a case as you do. And uh, for his, humans were here tens of millions of years ago. And, uh, you know, his book is, you know, 900 pages long. Tens he's, of millions? Yeah, tens of millions, okay? And he's a Hindu. Mm. So his idea is, you know, this sort of long recycling and... and but know. what evidence is it based well, on for okay. tens of millions it's, of years? It, I'm not here to defend Michael Cremo or to have a discussion about Michael Cremo. Uh -huh. That's not why I'm sitting at this I table. I understand, but my point is that... Michael Cremo is not me. It, it, that's right. So, but, but there's lots of alternative archaeology, which is where I began. There's lots of alternative archaeology books and Right, but what evidence is there that supports that? None. So why are you well, bringing but, up but, that when there's evidence he, that he's bringing up? No, it, it, Cremo's evidence is similar to his. It's why? mostly negative evidence that I don't accept the date of this. There is this peculiar sort of f footprint looking thing in the mud. Cremo refers specifically to the knowledge filter. The most useful thing about that book is the publication of uh, reports, archaeological reports, which are no longer available to the public, which, which do suggest an alternative point of view. I would right. say it's a very useful book to read. Beyond that, I have nothing to say about right. it. Right. So, yeah, but that's not necessarily true. You're saying his only evidence I mean, he's, he's pointing to, like, some pretty significant evidence. Like, this, the Sphinx thing is, is a geologist from Boston University proposed this because of water erosion. Because of water erosion that could have only been done by thousands of years of rainfall, in his opinion, as a, as a qualified okay. geologist. Right. Like, that's not a lack of evidence. I, I understand. But why do no, no other uh, geologists or archaeologists There are other. No, well, that's not true. Actually, they do. And I've had multiple conversations with Robert where he has cited the fact that he has gotten uh, a considerable body of support from other geologists, not from Egyptologists, but from geologists who do recognize the effects of severe water erosion on limestone, carbonate rocks, and that's what we have there. We have a severe water erosion that appears and is preserved on the quarry walls around the Sphinx. The Sphinx itself, as Graham said, is difficult to ascertain because of all of the reconstruction that has gone on. But the quarry walls, which would have once had the very distinct stepped profile of a typical quarry, um, no longer have that. I mean, they have now they have a textbook profile, uh, parabolic profile that would be consistent with sheet flooding, which would be both dissolution because carbonate rocks dissolve in um, acidic waters and what's called corrasion, which would be the effects of uh, water loaded with uh, sand sediment, which would make it very rough. So if you've got the sand sediment um, flowing over the edge of what would have been a quarry wall, what you're going to end up with is a smoothing off of the rough corners, and the final result would be a, a, a very rounded profile like you see there. And you would also see where the fissures in the rock would be selectively widened and opened by the water penetrating those fissures. I mean, it, it has all of the earmarks of a very um, textbook case of water erosion. Don't you think it's very disingenuous comparing that to someone who thinks that human beings have been here for tens of millions of years with no evidence to support it whatsoever? Well, he, he doesn't say, he, of course, he doesn't say he has no evidence. He has a 900-page book full of evidence. It's the quality of the evidence. When what you about say, the quality of that evidence? It, it's okay, okay. If it was that good, you know, we're not geologists sitting here. If it was that good, why don't geologists look at it and go, he's right? But they well, do. They they do. Have, okay. That's You're the not point. Listening. They do. They all do. No, some they don't do. all do. Okay. Some why? geologists who some geologists who work with Egyptologists say that shock is wrong. Okay. We have a geologist on the line. Why don't we ask him? Mark. Well, we can have one guy's opinion. We could also have other guys' opinions that we can get from. I mean, this matter has been but in the public domain since 1992. It hasn't gone away.
yeah. Shock's argument that we are looking at precipitation-induced weathering on the Sphinx has not been debunked. It has been opposed. It has been disagreed with. But that is different from saying it's debunked. And Shock stays solid and strong on that issue. He is a credentialed geologist. He is a professor of geology at the University of Boston. He has a right to speak out about this. And he stated his view. I happen to find his view very interesting, especially since it, it correlates with what I regard as the interesting astronomy of the site. I think that site has origins that do go back into the Younger Dryas. That's my opinion. I've stated it many times, and I've presented the evidence that I think underwrites that opinion. You and your colleagues are absolutely at liberty to disagree, but and you do. You don't think it's disingenuous to compare that to someone who says something that defies our current understanding of human beings and the, 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 the actual evolution? Evolution of humans. Okay. Like you're talking about someone who's saying that human beings are how many millions of years old? Tens of millions. Tens of millions. Yeah. Well, we know for a fact, right? As far if you yep. pay attention yeah. to evolution, right? right? right. But that's they, we weren't well, even but, humans but Joe, a million years ago, correct? I mean, there are creationists who think. Okay, yeah, but right. we're not talking about them. We're talking about Graham I Hancock. Know. I know, but my point was that so here you have the mainstream scientists, and and so it's like there's Graham. He seems so reasonable, but there's fifty like him, and each of them thinks. That they're they're right. They're not. There's your language. He seems wow. so reasonable. Right. So you you're right there. You're accusing me of dissimulation. And you're I saying seem there's reasonable, 50 but like him. the subtext is that I'm not. And then there's 50 like me. You're, this is more what a patronizing, strong, arrogant, no, I don't mean deeply it to, unpleasant and personal approach. Graham, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it to sound like that. I really don't. Okay. Okay. I have a larger point. That, Apology accepted. Uh, yeah. That. Uh, when you're faced with a bunch of different alternative theories that are coming in, and it's not, it's like, take, take physics. I mean, every physicist, like you just had Lawrence Krauss, he gets these letters daily of people saying, I think I figured out why Einstein was wrong. And, and he can't address them all. And, and, and they're smart people, they're thoughtful people, they really believe it. What do you do with that? That's well, my point. I, I feel that's not my problem. And, and if there are alternative the- uh, other alternative theories, that's not my problem either. It's the problem for the mainstream to sort it out and figure which yeah, to pay attention well, to and well, which not. All right. Well, I'm suspicious of this, the whole idea of the mainstream because even looking in the mainstream, you find so many divergent points of yeah. view that I, you know, I, I think that's basically a fiction, that there is this mainstream that has arrived at this consensus and that there are no alternative ulterior motives there. Um, and that there are no dogmas that are being um, perpetuated there. You know, I mean, I look at the lot of the geological stuff and, and realize that there are many different points of view. When we get to talk about the these floods at the end of the last ice age, there are many divergent points of view. There is what could be considered the mainstream, yet even that has multiple interpretations. And the same with this the, the comet idea. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know what constitutes the mainstream there because there have been a group that has opposed it at every turn. But at the same time, the group that accepts the comet hypothesis has continued to grow. In fact, there's even a number of, of individuals involved that set out specifically to, to disprove it or discredit it who are now basically on board. And it has grown from being a small handful of scientists to there are now 63 scientists from 55 different institutions that are on board with the idea that something remarkable happened at the end of the last ice age. It was probably exogenic, meaning something from outside, um, something from space. There's no uh, consensus as to exactly what that was, which would be normal because these discoveries are in, in their infancy at this point. But there's been an attempt to discredit the idea simply because that as the evidence has come in over the last decade, it has evolved and and new mysteries have been opened up uh, as the evidence comes in and the claim is being made, well, there's no um, consistent um, interpretation of this evidence and therefore we've debunked it. I mean, an example is Pinter's Requiem, Pinter and yeah. Dalton Requiem for the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. I mean, they publish a paper in PNAS saying Requiem, suggesting that the impact hypothesis is already dead. That was in 2011. Every single one of Pinter's points have been responded to. Those who are critical of the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis rarely cite the fact that the so-called refutations have themselves been refuted, that new information is constantly coming in. I see a very one-sided game being 
being played here with a group of academics who are determined to demonstrate that there could have been no possibility of anything like a comet impact 12,800 years ago and that these 63 or 65 scientists who are proposing that are just completely wrong. And when they refute the refutations, I very rarely see the, that, that uh, referred to or commented upon at all. Again, your, your colleague uh, de, de, de Fant has uh, you know, dismissed the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis without actually going in detail into the well, debate he, that's he, gone on. He has this graph in his paper showing all these uh, different dates for mm -hmm. the, uh, these different... That's from one of the critical papers. You yeah, know, there's another yeah. side to this so argument. Is, so he needs, to be, he needs to be listening to what the other side would say. Well, that's the point where maybe we should have Mark Defant come on and maybe we should have uh, Malcolm Lecomte come on as well because Malcolm yeah, Lecomte is right. actually one of those 63 yeah, yeah. Younger Dryas Impact yeah, Scientists. Yeah, well, what is the, well, explain to people that are just listening to this, what is this graph that you're showing? Well, this is the um, carbon-14 uh, date ranges from samples taken from the Younger uh, Dryas boundary. So this is the boundary here, and the point of this is that there's not a single consistent series of dates that would consistently show, yep, absolutely for sure, at every site it comes in right there, is that they bounce around a lot here. So mm -hmm. Now maybe Mark, this is you know his area, he could come on and Skype here. And they bounce us. around, and what's the, what's the point of this for the lay person who's listening to this? Uh, well, so if you take the ones that are above the gray line, then those were those are showing that something like an impact happened much earlier or much later, and the ones below it are that it's you know much earlier. So mm -hmm. where's the consistency of a single impact consistent across that middle of that gray? I don't line? think there's any argument that it was a, a single impact. In fact, there's a, well, there's no, arguments that there was no there's more than one day. We're talking about a stretch of thousands of years. And multiple impacts. The Younger Dryas so, uh, runs 1,200 years. Randall, please, t please give me your your because you're the expert at this. <laughs> well, these are dates for the Younger Dryas. There's a big spread, obviously, but there's also a lot of possibilities for introducing um, uh, inaccuracies into the dating. The what's called the old wood effect can sometimes uh, make uh, make it appear to be older than it is by a millennium or two millennium. Um, but what we certainly do see here is a clustering right around 13,000 years ago. That looks pretty evident to me. And everybody knows who does radiocarbon dating that the, the dating might have errors and inconsistencies in, in it. The one article I think that came out last year by James Kennett and 25 others was the Bayesian chronological analysis consistent with synchronous age of 12,835 to 12,735 calibrated years before present for younger driest boundary on four continents. Yeah. That's and a refutation of precisely what you're that publishing. Is, it there. is. It's a refutation but but, of this. But Mark Defant does not refer to that refutation. Jamie, could you pull up uh, the age of Leo? I think I gave that to you. Um, and go to slide number um, 167. Wow. 167. And that, that, that refers to the, go to slide 167. Jesus, you're not fucking around. <laughs> 167 slides. There we go. <clears throat> There we go. A cosmic impact event at 12,800 calibrated years before present formed the Younger Dryas boundary layer containing peak abundances in multiple high temperature impact related proxies, including spherules, milk glass, and nano diamonds. Bayesian statistical analysis of 354 dates from 23 sedimentary sequences over four continents established a model Younger Dryas boundary age of 12,835 calibrated years before present, supporting a synchronicity of the Younger Dryas boundary layer at high probability, 95%. This range over Overlaps that of a platinum peak recorded in the Greenland ice sheet and of the onset of the Younger Dryas climate episode in six key records, suggesting a causal connection between the impact event and the Younger Dryas. Due to its rarity and distinctive characteristics, the Younger Dryas boundary layer is proposed as a widespread correlation datum. And, and Randall, if I can remember what you said correctly, you believe that there was probably more than one significant impact over a period of several thousand years. Well, uh, let me let me pop in on that okay. very very quickly. I don't mean to cut you off. Go ahead, Russell, but, but, but the, 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 let's be clear. The suggestion is that 12,800 years ago, uh, there was uh, comets break up into multiple parts. I mean, anybody who saw the Shoemaker Levy nine NASA mm -hmm. films back in 1994 is aware that that 
comet broke up into more than 20 fragments, all of which hit Jupiter, uh, sometimes creating explosions larger than the Earth itself. All right, so I don't think it's controversial that comets break up into fragments. And this is the suggestion of the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, that we're dealing with a giant comet that broke up into multiple fragments that orbits in the torrid meteor stream, and that four of those fragments, that's the, the, the suggestion, four largest fragments, fell out of the torrid meteor stream, coming in on a trajectory roughly northwest to southeast, crossing the North American ice cap, and there, there are up to four impacts on the North American ice cap. The, 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 the impactors then continue across the Atlantic Ocean. There's a suggestion of impacts in uh, Belgium, and uh, indeed as far east as Abu Huraira in, in, in Syria. It's a, it's a global event, 50 million square kilometers of the Earth's surface is, is within the Younger Dryas boundary field. It's a really huge thing. So the suggestion is that there were multiple impacts at the beginning. Now, the next question is what happened 11,600 years ago when the Younger Dryas ends? And global temperatures shoot up incredibly rapidly. And the science on that is much less advanced than the science on the beginning of the Younger Dryas. Mm. Fred Hoyle, back in the 1980s, was puzzled by the sudden temperature increase at the end of the Younger Dryas. And he suggested, presciently, I would say, that uh, this may have been caused by a comet impact in an ocean. So maybe other bits of the torrid meteor stream impacted the Earth, other filaments within the stream impacted the Earth 11,600 years ago, or maybe something else caused it. I mean, Robert Schock is, is in, in favor of uh, extraordinary solar activity being responsible for that warming. We don't absolutely know, but that, that's broadly the, su the suggestion. We have the beginning and the end, it certainly impacts at the beginning, possibly impacts or other things at the, at the end. Well, Klub and Napier and others, Duncan Steele and other astronomers, have speculated that there could be impact um, eras, epochs, in which there's a, an enhanced possibility of the Earth being impacted, particularly if you have a large comet that enters into the solar system, begins to undergo a hierarchy of disintegrations, and basically litters the inner solar system with the material. And we do know that the Earth crosses the torrid meteor stream twice each year, once in late June and um, once in uh, late October, early November. And we know that the uh, Tunguska event of 1908, which is not speculative, I mean, that happened. It occurred on June 30th, which would have been the peak of the torrid meteor shower. It also came from the direction of the sun. It, it's, um, its position in space, where it, where it emanated, its radiant point in space from which it emanated at that time was totally consistent with um, the torrid meteor stream radiant. So it's very possible that the, that the Tunguska event of 1908 was a member of that family of meteorites. Um, and so, you know, that would be, again, we don't, there's no, nothing definitive there, but it would be a prime candidate for investigation that, that perhaps, and again, I mentioned earlier, this goes back to the work of Fred Whipple way back in the 1940s, who began to um, research the tarred meteor stream and came to believe that it was much, much more active in, in the past than it is now, that it's an old diffuse meteor stream that at one time, um, and like Graham said, you know, it's, it has... Uh, multiple objects still within it. Um, comet Enki is the best known. Comet We're Enki is the best fragment, known. That's a fragment of the original giant of comet. Of the original giant comet that they estimate might have been um, based upon the amount of material still um, remnant in the zodiacal light cloud um, that perhaps it was somewhere around 60 miles or 100 kilometers in diameter. Mm -hmm. And an, another thing that I'm that I'm taken to task for is the, that I report the work of Klub and Napier and their suggestion that the torrid meteor stream is actually fucking dangerous and that we should be paying attention to it, that it has been a hidden hand in human history in the past and that it can cause us trouble in the future. Now, this is not gloom and doom. We have the technology to deal with the large objects in the torrid meteor stream if any filaments are on an Earth, uh, an orbit that will result in impacts on the Earth. At the very least, it's extremely unwise of us not to pay attention. I'm, I'm accused of being sort of a doom monger and constantly predicting the end of the world and this and that, but actually I'm simply reporting astronomers who are very concerned about the torrid meteor stream and the possibility that we may face further impacts from it in the future. That's not woo-woo, that is science, you know. Absolutely, and I would agree with that, and, that's, that, and that is a form of catastrophism uh, that scientists accept as mm. the very real. And Some do. That, well, lots. I mean, there's, you know... The what, if anything, do you oppose about what they've just said? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing about the Younger Dryas period. Well, so I, uh, just on a technical question, you had your slide was 12,800. 
on there. And so get Gebekli Tepe, the, you know, the oldest C14 dates are what, 90, so 11,000. 11, all right, so, so that's a 1,200-year gap. Uh, oh, Gobekli, a, Gobekli that's a kind Tepe. Of a slow catastrophe. Well, no, no. Gobekli Tepe. <laughs> we to be very clear about about the Younger Dryas. One of the puzzling things about it is that you have cataclysm at the beginning, and this global temperature slump is surely cataclysmic by any standards. And you have cataclysm at the end. You have uh, a massive. Sp- Spike a, a huge increase in global temperatures, and you have meltwater pulse one B. You have a lot of water going into the ocean at that time. So both ends of the Younger Dryas are cataclysmic, and it's at the recent end of the Younger Dryas, eleven thousand six hundred years ago, that we see Gobekli Tepe mysteriously popping up. And I know that you're a staunch opponent of Atlantis and that you believe Plato made Atlantis up in order to make a political point, and you may be right, but the date that Plato puts on the submergence of Atlantis is 11,600 years ago, 9,000 years before the time of Solon, which happens to coincide with Meltwater Pulse 1b one one and the end of the Younger Dryas, which I would have thought would cause you to rethink your position on Plato just a little. Well, uh, it's interesting. Hmm. I'm open to the idea. I tend to read myths in, in the same way your guest uh, Jordan Peterson does, that you know, it's a story to deliver some sort of moral homily to us. It's a commentary on our own culture, our society. It's a way, a literary way of delivering a message to people. That's how I tend to read. Instead of reading them like, let's see if we can figure out what happened historically. Let's but there's look, hard look data. Up. There's hard data in Plato's whatever you think it is. And that hard data is, data is that the submergence of Atlantis happened 9,000 years before the time of Solon. That is a date. That is 9,600 BC. That is 11,600 years ago. This, to me, is a strong reason why we shouldn't just completely dismiss Plato's notion of a lost civilization of the Ice I, I'm Age. I'm not against that idea. I mean, the idea that, say, the parting of the Red Sea happened because of some impact. That's not, I'm not proposing that. I'm Please don't saying, go there. I'm not, Waste of time. Okay, but but there are people that think that. And I don't. It, okay, or or that the plagues of the Bible can be explained by I don't go by, there. By Waste of time. But, okay, Deal I, with Plato. All right, So, but my point is that some of them may have historical origins. Some of them may be completely made up as mythic stories for some other reason. You have to take them one at a time. In my opinion, the Plato one is a commentary on his own culture of Athens and being too bellicose, being too warlike, and that this is not good for where we're going. That's my opinion. And the the fact that he picks a date that coincides with the geologically significant date of flooding is not really going to change your opinion. I think, well, I think, again, that's... It's a pretty amazing coincidence. Is it? I mean, it, we're finding yeah. a connection, not Plato. I mean, we're... we're well, Plato said we're there was an advanced civilization with, with advanced agriculture, advanced architecture, advanced navigational abilities, which was submerged by the sea, swept from the face of the earth, so that mankind had to begin again like children with no memory of what went before. And lo and behold, he puts a geologically significant date on that, a date that we ourselves have only known is significant in the last 20 or 30 years. Mm-hmm. So where is this place, this Atlantis? I mean, so as you know, there's, Not a long my problem. Hist- there's, a, there's a long history of people speculating. If we found a site, that would be a big plus. Go for do more marine position. archaeology. Well, if we, if we take it literally, obviously then it's below the ocean. But, I, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily take Plato's account literally, but I do say, well, it's rather coincidental that he, his dating falls exactly on Meltwater Pulse 1b when we know there was huge influx of water into the ocean. And also, if we look at the his geography, it, it, it's interesting because he cites, um, you know, basically a landmass west of the Pillars of Heracles, which is Pillars of Hercules, the Straits of Gibraltar. And he places this in the, essentially in the mid-Atlantic. Um, I think it was Crantor, one of the, comp, the, the um, um, commentators on, on him, that said it was something like three or four days sail west. Uh, but if you look there, there is a sunken landmass that sank at the end of the last ice age because of the rapidly rising sea level. And this has been well established by marine geology, looking at evidence that, that the Azores Plateau underwent an isostatic subsidence, which would have been resulting from the rapidly rising sea level. We know there's no doubt that the North American continent has uh, rebounded isostatically after the removal of this tremendous mass of ice that that mantled North America up to anywhere from a thousand to possibly fifteen hundred feet. Well, 
<clears throat> if you if you do a comparable isostatic adjustment of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, you'll find that the Azores Island complex are much much larger, and it turns out that that might actually be a nice place to develop a at least a maritime culture, something along the lines of the Phoenicians or the Minoans during the period of the Ice Age, because during the period of the Ice Age, the climate of the world was so much different than now. Um, <clears throat> you know, the Great Basin area was filled with huge lakes, um, vegetation, forests, savanna and grasslands. Um, like Graham said, um, with the lowered sea level, there were uh, much larger areas of the coastline that were exposed. Um, and that's probably where most of people would have resided during the Ice Ages near the coastlines because that would have been the most benevolent place. With the rising of the sea level, all of that's lost. And there's nothing really fringed about saying, well, people might have lived on islands in the mid-Atlantic, especially when we know that the that those islands most likely had a, a, a benevolent climate during the Ice Age. So I, I, I don't go into, you know, crystal technology and flying machines or Me whatever, neither. all of this Me speculative neither. stuff that has accreted to it. But if we just keep it simple and say, well, is it possible that a culture along the lines of the Minoans or the Phoenicians could have existed? Could they have existed on an island culture in the mid-Atlantic? And there's nothing really, you know, extreme about that idea, uh, in my mind. Even the idea that a more advanced uh sophisticated quasi-technological culture coexisted with hunter-gatherers isn't too strange. I mean, well, we, do so, we, do, we do so today. We coexist yeah. with hunter-gatherers sure. in the Amazon jungle who don't even know we, you know, we exist. I mean, so I, I, don't see, I don't see why a priori that's just an impossible idea to look Am at. Am I misremembering that you, uh, in your book, you mentioned Indonesia as a site for Atlantis? I mentioned I mentioned Gunung Padang not as a site for Atlantis. That's Danny Hillman Natuwajaja, who oh, okay. is a geologist. Um, he's Indonesia's leading expert in megathrust earthquakes, as a matter of fact. He has written a book proposing that Indonesia was Atlantis and that Gunung Padang, which he's been involved in investigating, uh, is a site from Atlantean times. Danny has Danny has proposed that. Now, what's interesting about Indonesia uh, is that Indonesia sits upon the Sunda Shelf, and the Sunda Shelf shelf was one of the parts of the world that was most massively flooded at the end of the Ice Age. I mean, if you go back to the end of the Ice Age, you're not looking at the Malaysian Peninsula. You're not looking at the Indonesian islands out going out towards the Philippines. You're looking at a giant continent-sized landmass, all of which went uh, underwater at the end of the last Ice Age, really rather rapidly. So uh, I think he has a point. I think it's an interesting, it's, it's one of those areas in the world where there was very large scale flooding. Huge amounts of land were swallowed up. Also Sahel, the, the connection of Australia to New Guinea during the Ice Age was also mm -hmm. washed away. There's, there's, there's a, you know, a whole range of, of issues regarding sea level rise in that very area, which anybody with an interest in these subjects should be paying attention to. So it's quite possible that, like today, many of the advanced civilizations of today are on the water, whether yes. it's New York or Los Angeles, and that was probably the case back then. And so the idea of Atlantis might not have been about one particular area, but many advanced areas that were wiped out along with their knowledge. Yeah. With, with right, this, is, this is the with thesis of that syllables. book I mentioned, Noah's uh, Flood, that the, the two geologists with the Black Sea the theory, uh, that there were, you know, it was rimmed with uh, s small villages and, you know, the massive flooding almost instantly wiped out. And then that gets passed down as, you know, the oral tradition is these right. myths. To me, that seems totally reasonable. Totally reasonable. Yeah. Well, right. why don't we get into more discussion about the actual impact hypothesis yeah. and yes. the mega flooding so that we can get our... Uh, Yes. You know, our guys get on standby, your, get them is, involved. What is your geologist, your geologist, since you're by yourself and there's two of them, um, what is, <laughs> it's only fair, right? What is your geologist opposed to what uh, Randall and Graham are proposing? I, I think it's the, uh, on the impact hypothesis versus the um, multiple um, glacial dams that burst over periods of time, like that, uh, I have that slide um, okay, well, let's call that, him up and, and get him and, on Skype. And, and We've never done this before, yeah, okay. so this might suck. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully it'll work. See, this, this slide here, um, he is showing these are each independent carbon-14 dates of these different uh, instant floods mm -hmm. in, in North America right. from in, in, in each individual ice dams. And what broke. separates these dates? Uh, well, they're separated by... Well, looks like from 20,000 to 12,000, so all before uh, the impact. Well, 12,800, wasn't that? Well, Mark, so yes, Mark's right, on the right, line. Right, so right it's Mark's there. on the yeah, line. Yeah. Uh, what is this? Mark, would it, 
Mark, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Mark Defant. Right? Mark Defant, thank you very much for doing this. We really appreciate uh, you coming on here. It's my pleasure. Uh, so you've had a chance to listen to these uh, guys talk. What What is your thoughts just stepping into this cold? Well, first of all, uh, I did not mean to upset Mr. Hancock. Uh, he seemed to be quite disturbed, and I want to apologize if I've disturbed him. No, 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 you it's haven't, disturb, you haven't disturbed me, and I'm not, I'm not upset. It's just simply that you're extremely selective in what you present in your, in your draft, admittedly draft article that you've chosen to put online. Uh, you don't uh, represent. Yes, you don't represent students, me accurately. Let me go ahead and, and answer his question because I know we're getting short on time. No, here. no, no. We're pl we have um, plenty of time. We have plenty of time. Okay. Well, first of all, could I? Would you allow me just to address uh, Gobekli Tepe for a minute? Sure. Would you like uh, to address the article first? I think that probably would be the most fair since we just brought that up. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. What What was the question then? Graham? Well, the qu I, I read out on air various passages in your article where you misrepresent me. Um, no, I did. Sorry? No, I didn't re misrepresent you. You didn't misrepresent me. No. Okay. So in fact, you, you said that I, uh, that I said that, uh, uh, that I was actually talking about someone in Indonesia when I said you didn't understand Newton's physics. You no, I didn't say. I'm sorry. I didn't say. There. I didn't say you were talking about someone in Indonesia. I said you were talking about you, Jesus. You don't know Jesus, Jesus, mechanics. Jesus Gamara in um, uh, in Peru is who I was talking about, and Jesus Gamara does have very exotic views on gravitation, which I state seriously are not my interest. I do say he may be right, but I don't say he's right. I say this is not my interest, and I go on to say what my interest in is his work. You Excuse pick on me, that. You're, you're drowning me out here. I was asked to explain whether or not uh, I thought I was misleading, and I don't think I was misleading. You clearly stayed in there that maybe gravity was due to the way uh, we've changed orbits around the sun. Gravity is not due to that. It's due to no, I the don't state uh, that. mass and the inverse uh, of, what, what do you mean? I don't state that. Jesus Gamara yes, states do. that, and I, I say I disagree there. with it. Oh, come on. I say well, I anyway, disagree with I it. Wanna be, I want to be respectful. I can't really hear you when I'm talking. I apologize. But I, I feel like uh, you've, you are selecting selectively changing the meaning of what I'm saying. Well, okay, why, no, don't no, you, no, why don't you quote me as these words from my text? When you say that I buy the gravity thing of Jesus Gamara, why no. don't you quote me when I say... No, I, hold on. That, I said just that, the opposite of that. What I go on to say, not quoted in the attack, is the following, quote, however, this isn't the part of his theory I'm interested in. Where I feel right. he is solidly persuasive is in his observations of the anomalous character of the monuments of the Andes. I am not pinning anything on Jesus Gamara's gravitational ideas. I am saying I very clearly not. what it is in his approach that I am interested in. I'm not going to dismiss all of his approach because he has an approach on gravity that you don't like. That's not even of interest to me, and I say so in the book. You don't report that, therefore I suggest you misrepresent me. No, well, we, Mr. We, Hancock, what I brought up uh, him for was simply to state that you didn't understand, and I say it right there, that you don't understand Newton's physics. But I'm not even so talking how about are we to Newton's. Take you I'm not talking as a about. Scientist, if you don't understand Newton's simple I physics, am not the talking, laws of Newton. If I, if, I wished, if I wished to make an argument about gravity, I wouldn't go saying that that isn't the part of Jesus Gamara's theory that I'm interested in. I'm interested in the other aspect of his work, his observations through My years of field work. My point wasn't that. My point was simply to point out that you didn't understand Newton mechanics. But when I I'm don't talking about stop, this stop, guy. Stop, stop, You're completely wasting stop. time here. Okay, gr Graham, we, uh, no, I, I the, the way the article Michael, is... Hold on a second. Hold on. Let these guys talk we it did, out. We did misrepresent him. We did. Yeah. The way the sentence is structured, uh, it, it's clearly out of context. We, we're we're going to change that. Yeah, yeah I, I was mean, taken I mean, out of Mark, context, Mark, and that's what I'm objecting Mark, to. Mark, I'm not sure why he included it in the book in the first place, but he's not arguing about uh, the gravity at all. So we will fix that. May, maybe uh, we could get straight to the, the flooding thing that, uh, that uh, as long Randall as was talking about. Graham is fine with that. I mean, Graham, I know there was something else well, that yeah, you the other Well, yeah, the to. other thing that I, I find to be misrepresenting is that the statement, yet 
Hancock makes the following stunning claim, quote, our ancestors are being initiated into the secrets of metals and how to make swords and knives. What Mark Defant does not tell his readers is that I make that claim. I don't make that claim. I am actually reporting what is said in the Book of Enoch. That's not me who's saying okay, we that. Will fix That's that. the Book of Enoch. Graham, we'll fix that. Okay. Otherwise, let's get, let's get back to the main meat yeah. of this, for God's sake. Okay. Just give me the list of things that, you know, and I'll fix it. I will. It. We'll fix them. Yeah. Because okay. that's not the point of that. Um, well, Mark, you're obviously very critical of Graham's work, and uh, maybe erroneously so. But let's, let's get to what you think about what you've heard so far. All right, Mr. Rogan. Um, I, I don't want to come across as a, as a pompous scientist. What I want to do is I want to protect people from these grandiose uh, assumptions. Gr Graham in his first, Mr. Hancock in his first book. Please call uh, me Graham. Fingerprints. Please call me Graham. Okay, Graham in his first book in, in Fingerprints uh, suggested that, that there was a, a, a continent uh, where this civilization lived and, and through some machinations this continent uh, went south and, and ended up destroying that civilization. Well, as a geologist, that, that's, just, that's just nonsense. Mm -hmm. And now he comes back and he wants us to believe that he was all wrong, and then all of a sudden it's okay now to believe in comet strikes so to I'm, kill this, this famous civilization so, that's supposed to exist. So Mark, well, this is duping people. Mark, I don't know if he means to do it, but Mark, he certainly seems to be duping people. Mark, all my work is in print and online. I mean, I, see that, I gather that you see your role as a protector for the public. Obviously, you feel that the public are not intelligent enough to make discerning decisions of their own in this respect. No, However, to address... I'm saying that the public doesn't understand the science... Okay. Okay, so uh, they, to the degree that you're misrepresenting. So they need the superior knowledge of Mark Defant in order to understand no, it. Well, fine. I think they need the knowledge of science. Okay, well, that's not okay. The knowledge that I have. Let me come to your point, uh, which is you're saying that I proposed one mechanism for cataclysm in Fingerprints of the Gods, and that I'm proposing another mechanism for cataclysm today. What I proposed in Fingerprints of the Gods was that there had been a gigantic cataclysm in the ballpark of 12,500 years ago. I looked at a number of possibilities of which the most striking to me at the time was earth crust displacement. And earth crust displacement is reported, it's the work of Charles Hapgood, not my work, but I do report it in Fingerprints of the Gods as an excellent theory which uh, explains the information. Since I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot and I wouldn't want to defend that theory strongly today. I don't know if you have bought the latest edition of my book, the, the paperback edition of Magicians of the Gods, but it contains a chapter saying whatever happened to earth crust displacement. I address the change of view in this, and I think I have a right to change my view, and I think it's, it's healthy that, I, I mean, why would I stick permanently to a view that I hold in 1995 if new evidence persuades me that it's wrong? I'm sure that's a good thing, not a bad thing, and uh, I'm fundamental proposition is we had a massive global cataclysm in the ballpark of 12,500 years ago. So naturally, it's of great interest to me when a large group of scientists, more than 60 of them, over a period of more than 10 years now, present evidence of a massive comet impact event 12,800 years ago, exactly Graham, in the window I proposed. Slippery. You are implying that there are a lot of people out there that believe in this. There are, there are some people that believe in it, I agree, but for the most part, uh, I think of taking an honest view, the comet hypothesis has gotten debunked. Well, that's much. complete rubbish, by Mark. Way, that's complete by the rubbish. Way, I would also point out that in fingerprints, you had people believing that the end of the world was coming in 2012. Now, how am I supposed to take you seriously when you say things like that and then change your mind? We could all be dead by now yes. if we believed you. I have absolutely changed my mind on the Mayan calendar. Uh, I regard the Mayan calendar as an interesting technological artifact with uh, a better estimate of the length of the solar year than the estimate that we have with uh, today. The Mayan calendar is based primarily on the position of the sun amongst the constellations at the winter solstice. And we are in an 80-year window when the sun sits astride the dark rift of the Milky Way between the constellations of Sagittarius and Scorpio uh, on the winter solstice. That window is 80 years wide. So the story of the Mayan calendar, by the way, isn't actually quite over yet. But Do you I'm know not what procession I'm not, means? Yes, Do I you know, know what exactly what means? procession means. Okay, well, all of this stuff that you claim uh, is on a procession. A procession is the 
Is the, the earth spinning like a top? Don't teach it grandma to suck to eggs. It has do with running through comet clouds. And yet you're saying that somehow we're on some sort of cycle where the comets are going to come back and strike the earth uh, right now, sometime during the next 40 years. That's what you said in Magicians. No, that's what, is, that's, is what Victor, that's what Victor Klube and Bill Napier and Emilio Spedicato say. Don't I'm a, this on, I'm a on reporter. You're the one that said it in your I'm, book. You just I'm, got all over and I make, uh, Mr. Sherman. Uh, uh, Michael Shermer for for saying the same things about other people. I want to know what you think. But Mark, you tell I, me what you think. I am a reporter, and I make it very you, clear. You in can't the, cop out Mark, on it. You're not copying out. Mark, Let Mark, me finish. You're talking about Mark, science. Mark, we gotta. We can't talk over each other I like this. I am a reporter, and it is my job to report the work of other people. And I report the work of Victor Klub, Bill Napier, and Emilio Spedicato, all of whom draw attention to the torrid meteor stream and who regard it as the greatest collision hazard facing the Earth at this time, and who specifically indicate that we may run into a filament of the torrid meteor stream in the next 30 years that is going to be very bad for our civilization. It it's not my- it has nothing to do with precision. It's, uh, precession. When, when did I say it had anything to do with precession? You have a whole section it's not on caused, precession yes, in, I, in Magicians of the in, Gods. In, indeed as a clock, as a timer, as a way of going back through the ages, but I'm not saying precession is causing this encounter with the torrid meteor stream, and go find the paragraph where I no, say that. No, 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 no. What you're saying is that we're on a cycle, that 12,000 years ago, this civilization was destroyed, and now you're saying, oh, oh, that civilization was so smart that they knew we were going to go through another shower, and we're all doomed in the next 40 years. Yeah. Well, you didn't say doomed in, in magicians like you did in fingerprints, but we, we must conclude that that's your opinion because I, I don't know anybody else that you've referenced on that issue well but procession I, has nothing to do with that and I, it's not even on that cycle i never it has a cycle of about about twenty one thousand years so 25 your, your cycles are 20, even off on procession twenty five thousand nine hundred and twenty years actually that is not for the procession, procession. One degree every seventy-two years, give or take a small margin. That is the precession. In you're fact, really, you're really teaching grandma to suck eggs here. So, so anyway, I, I, I guess this has just been going on all day. You can't criticize Michael for bringing up other people that are saying strange things and comparing it to you and say, "Oh no, you can't say that because it's, it's not about me. It's not true. You're, you're doing the same thing. You're reporting about other people and saying nonsense." Yeah, Mark, I'm, rep Mark, I'm, I'm, I'm reporting the work of Victor Clue, Bill Napier, and Emilio Spedicato, and, and I also, I also indicate that I strongly support that work. That's as far as I go. With Mark, this. If, if I could stop you here, you, so you think that this comet wiping out all the Ice Age megafauna theory? has been debunked is that what you're saying no sir i have not saying that but, but i think that if you read the literature carefully the majority of scientists right now and i know that this is still a go and you know what i like about the comet people is that they're doing it in the scientifically right way they're getting people to review the material they're getting people to go through that gauntlet to where they get criticized they make sure that they do things right and they get it out there Firestone did this in 2007. He was crucified. He's come back. His his group has come back with a lot of good stuff. So I want to wait and see this play, play out. I said that in my paper, that we're going to have to wait to, to get a conclusion here. So I'm not saying that they're wrong, but right now, if I read the literature as a scientist, I have to say that the Comet guys are, are, are getting hit pretty hard. What do, you take, what do you make of the latest platinum paper in Nature's Scientific Reports? The platinum anomaly across North America and its coincident uh, in time with the Greenland ice cores and the platinum anomaly there. What do you say to that? Well, I say that, uh, and maybe we can bring him on, uh, the problem with that is, is that what does platinum have to do with the comet? You know, platinums are high in asteroids, but they're not high in comets. Comets are icy bodies. I saw the paper. I read it. Um, I think it's interesting, but I, I can't for the life of me figure out how he's correlating it. Uh, he has... In in the different areas of the Clovis, he has platinum concentrations that are that that are seemingly not matching up. They're outside the the younger Dryas. Uh, they're inside the younger Dryas. I'd like to I'd like you to show those. Let's if bring you can because let's let's bring Malcolm. It's hard to understand what he's trying to say. Let's other bring, than it doesn't refute the common hypothesis. Let's bring Malcolm on since he's one of the co-authors of the um, platinum paper. This is going to get super complicated. But let's I can try only do one caller at a time. We can only do one caller at a time, apparently. Well, I think my, Malcolm, you know, should 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 have his voice. Well, here. I don't want to criticize him if he can't well, be here. That's okay. What I'd like Mark, to do is go back and talk a little bit, if I may, 
about uh, Go Gobekli Tepe because I I've read uh, Schmidt. I, I know that Schmidt never uh, ever found anything to suggest that there were anything in the early part of Gobekli Tepe that that were not hunter gatherers. They all were hunter gatherers. You know, he found twenty. I think I, I may be wrong on this, but I think he found twenty two thousand stone tools there uh, when he dug that place up. I'm he not disputing that. He never found any domesticated animals. He never found any domesticated grain. He, he found tons of bones of animals. So we know that about 100 to 200 people were probably working on Gobekli Tepe at one time, and they were fed by wild animals and grain. So there's no reason to go out on a limb here and say that some magical civilization came in. And by the way, that's another thing that drives me crazy. You're saying that these guys were magicians. You're saying that they had secret knowledge. What possible secret knowledge did they give to the people at Gobekli uh, Tebi? How can you possibly again, say I'm, things I'm like that? Again, I'm not saying that. The word magicians of the gods comes from the Apkalu in ancient Sumer. And they were considered to have superior powers, and they were considered to be magicians of a sort. Am I, should I not report that because it's there in the no, Sumerian text? No, I think you should tell us what Michael's been asking all day is what were their superpowers? I'm not saying that they had superpowers. It's the Sumerians who said that. I simply report that. You can regard that as a cop out if you like, but I am a Why fucking reporter. Why did you reporter. call your book Magicians of the Gods? Because that's the direct implication of the Apkalu. They were the no, magicians of the it gods. Sounds like you're saying they had magical powers to me. No, I'm saying that they were the magicians of the gods, as they were called in an ancient culture. That's all. Okay, I'm well, saying. I just want your audience to know that Schmidt, who worked there for 20 years, that that had didn't go there for two days and look around, take some notes, and leave, and write a book on it. He worked there for 20 years, and he found date with dates and everything. He found that there were hunter gatherers there building those megaliths. I don't you know, if you went to if you went to Easter Island Can I speak? and you found the the Moai. And, and, and you said, oh, my gosh, there must have been some secret civilization that made these Moai because stupid hunter-gatherers couldn't possibly make these. Well, we know that there were no special people on Easter Island. It had to be made by hunter-gatherers. Why would you poo-poo uh, the Sorry, are the you saying, are, are, and have to call a superior are you, civilization are you seri to do that? Are you seriously saying that the inhabitants of Easter Island were hunter-gatherers? Well, Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, we can so see on that the little population island, of, what, what, of the Pacific they, Ocean. They had we no agriculture, that they are you saying that? They didn't get to the Pacific Ocean until about 1,000 years ago. I mean, on, into Easter Island second. until about 1,000 years Mark, ago. What do you think they hold were? On they a certainly second. weren't uh, uh, a big civilization. Mark, Sorry. please let him respond. Go ahead. Well, first of all, have you met Cla Did you meet Klaus Schmidt? Do you know him personally? Well, you know he's dead, and yeah. you know that I haven't met him. No. Okay, well, I did meet him. I do know him personally. I, know I did too. record. I did record my interviews with him, uh, with his agreement, and and what he states clearly. I don't disagree with you that the people around Gobekli Tepe were hunter gatherers when Gobekli Tepe was started. What precisely intrigued Klaus Smith was the possibility, his phrase, not mine, that Gobekli Tepe was a center of innovation, a place where new ideas were deliberately seeded and spread out in the population. I have Klaus Schmidt on record saying that. I quote him saying that in my book. And that to me is a very interesting proposition because it suggests that we have a site here that is being used to mobilize a population and to transfer to them the knowledge of agriculture, which suddenly appears around Gobekli Tepe at the time that Gobekli Tepe is functioning. What do you mean by suddenly? Can I add to that? What I mean by, what I mean by suddenly is Klaus Schmidt that stated very clearly that these are the people, the very same people who made Gobekli Tepe, in Klaus Schmidt's view, are the people who quote unquote invented agriculture. If you don't mind me and interrupting here for a second, what, what about Easter Island? Was Easter Island established by hunter-gatherers or not? You were saying not? Yeah. You, yeah, say, yeah. you say it was established by hunter-gatherers. I say not. I say Easter Island was an agricultural society. What's there, what's there to hunt and gather on a tiny island? Have you been to Easter Island? I have six times. And you know you can walk across it in three hours. What's there to hunt and gather on that? Oh, no, you're misunderstanding my point. My oh, point is not. that these are not sophisticated people. Okay, but I sorry, you said... I agree you with you on Gobekli Tepe. Uh, I think that you got Schmidt right. And in fact, it's a UNESCO site. We all recognize how important it is. But what, what, what I think Michael and I can't understand is how this ties into some, some magnificent civilization. There's nothing there that indicates that they were influenced by some other civilization. Except the they, had, they started out as hunter-gatherers. 
and then they evolved I into uh, um, uh, agricultural society. And, and that's what makes it a great site. Can I answer you? You're seriously saying that there's nothing there. I mean, the largest megalithic site on Earth, 7,000 years older than Stonehenge is there. There's no background to it, no, no, no evidence no, no, of minute. practice or training. Uh, the megalithic site itself is the problem for me. Okay, I, I, I honestly, we've got megaliths in quite a few sites. And by the way, you're right. There's a megalith just down the road from Gobekli Tepe, and there are probably so that several other. I, I can see them on maps. Yeah, we need we've to get a, to the bottom of this. We've got a this. wonderful amount of work to do there. You bet. So I think, Graham, we're in gr good agreement on this. Okay, so you guys are in agreement on that. What I want to point out is, is that I don't think that there's any any need to call upon uh, this great civilization that you, you say exists. Well, to me, the simplest explanation is a transfer of knowledge, a transfer of technology. I've, I've been writing about the possibility of a lost civilization for more than a quarter of a century. That's what I do. I hope that it's a useful contribution to the, the debate. I mean, archaeologists can choose not to listen to anything I say, to dismiss me as a complete lunatic, as they often do, to accuse me, as you do, in writing of duping the public, of conning the public, and so on and so forth. I didn't you know, use you, the word conning. Well, you did use the word conning, actually. It's in the very last paragraph of your article, because I got it right here in front of me. We will fix that. that you did use the no, word conning. Michael, yeah. this was the first uh, thing I wrote. I just put it up for my students. Well, it's there. It's well, there. Wait, 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 hold on a second. Hold on, hold, hold on. on. Exactly. Hold on a second. I, am left, hold I am left with... What I am left with is that Hancock... I'm going to put my reading glasses on so I can read this properly. What I am left with, this is quoting you, Mark, is that Hancock has a real knack for conning a hellacious number of people into buying his books. I mean, that's well, a that's direct right. ad hominem insult. But, it's online me, in your article. Do you stand by it or not? Uh, listen, I apologize to you for the use of that language. Is that what you want to hear? Because I do. But I'm why, not, why, why I'm not you say I'm sorry you person. used it in the first place. I think you're misleading your students. Why would you well, say that you're just putting that online for your students as if that's not a big deal? You're putting it on the internet. And to say okay. that you're just putting well, it online for your students and you've been proven incorrect on how many different times in this article now? Well, about proven seven. Proven incorrect? I haven't been proven incorrect. Well, you have. You misquote me. You don't, give, you don't give the context. I'm and not even, the guy that said and the even Michael, was end and, in 2012. And even Michael has said that the skeptic article will not, re will not reflect these out-of-context statements that you're making here. Right, so the core is, is the impact hypothesis likely to be true or not, and as an independent phenomenon, is it connected to Gobekli Tepe and the Younger Dryas? I mean, that's kind of what we're getting at. So right. uh, th then we can, uh, maybe you can explain that graph that shows all the, the glacial dam bursts and the dating of those as, as thousands of years before the 12,800-year impact. Well, can we put the map up first? Um, and, we need to map then, up. You guys first can get into Michael. what does that what does that mean? Well, uh, <clears throat> which map is that? Which map? On oh, your um, uh, which map, Mark? Uh, I'm sorry, it's the glacial map. Uh, Western Washington or I'll, Washington I'll State and Oregon. Like. Yeah. Oh, it, 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 okay. Jamie will put it up. And, it, this, and this by map. the way, uh, I, I should to protect Michael here. Mm -hmm. I. I submitted this. Michael made immense amount of changes on that paper. I put it up because I wanted my students to see it. I had no idea that people would go online and, and look at that like yeah, you but good Lord. Then, and, but and unfortunately, you've sent tens of thousands of people probably to it by letting them know it's on here, and I'm sorry for that. Well, but anyway, let's go but to this But why map. is it okay to just put that up online for your students? Yeah, I don't why get you, that. Why, how come you don't have any problem with that, but you do have a problem with it as it stands being released to the general public? Um, well, you know, I think, maybe I, think I stand by everything I said, except for the the personal comment at the end. Well, we'll see okay, if that so let's survives the editing map. process. Yeah, let's. Okay, let's put up this map. Let's get up back to the map. Okay, the brown areas are now. I, I have to emphasize that that the Scablands is very famous. People have been working on geologists have been working on this for more than a hundred years. I bet and very intricate detailed mapping. And we now know what areas have been flooded. That's in the brown. The green areas are the old glacial lakes. Uh, one of them you can see uh, is the Columbia Lake. And the other one on the far right over in Montana, uh, that's Lake Missoula. Now, I, I guess my, my point here is, is that you guys want to make the flooding out here to be immense. And 
I, I think Brett's you know, original idea was that there was just one flooding. But then Brett's came to, to understand after looking at the data and all of the geology, geologic work that it wasn't just one flood, that it's many floods. And that was the point of all of those dates that I show you, that there, were, that there have been at least 17 specific floods dated. There are probably as many as 40 to 50 floods out there. And they're all probably related to uh, uh, glacial dams breaking. Now, where in the world would you ever say that this small area relative to an entire continent why would you say that this is evidence for a comet strike? Comet strike. Not even the comet guys are saying that this flooding out here is related to a comet, because there are a large number of area, a very small number of, of, of area, actual area that is flooded. If you take a look now at my dates, or not my dates, but the dates. Uh, do you have that, Michael, that's, the, the that's, one that's, with the... Yeah. Uh, We're going to bring that up, but uh, let, let's let Randall Carlson address you sure. now because he's oh, the no, one that's the well, expert of this. I mean, he's he's got a point that if you just look at, if you confine your, your examination to this area. But the point is, is you've got evidence of mega flooding all around the ice sheet margin from the Atlantic to the Pacific. You've got um, the work of... Uh, Kihu and Lord in the Midwestern states, um, South Dakota, North Dakota, uh, Eastern Montana. You've got massive spillways out there that discharged off the ice sheet. You have Glacial River Warren that was undoubtedly uh, formed by most likely Glacial Lake Agassiz. Uh, and you've got um, the St. Croix River where I uh, took Graham a couple of years ago that had mega floods down it. There were mega floods down the Mississippi River. There was Glacial Lake, Wisconsin that discharged down the Wisconsin River, left the Wisconsin Dells. Um, there are the Finger Lakes in New York that probably were created by uh, massive floods emanating off no, of that. they were scoured. Scoured, exactly, right. They were scoured, and they were probably scoured by subglacial floods that were coming under uh, high pressure. Because, you know, you have the Drumlin fields that are just to the south of them. And I, you've probably seen the work of John Shaw and uh, uh, yes. Claire Beanie and Bruce Rainey and those out of Canada. Yes, but I think Shaw's idea about Drummonds is crazy. Well, it, it, why, why would that be? Why would, how, how do you propose the Drumlins then were formed? Oh, easily. Uh, the, easily. The glaciers came forward and topped, topped the, 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 the terminal moraine and, and spread the, the moraines out to, into Drummonds. And, and, but how? I mean, you've got, you've got features that look like they're totally fluvially produced. You have, they look like inverted boat hills. You look at the internal stratification. How does glaciers create internal stratification? I've the, looked at, the, I've looked at, at numerous drumlins um, fr in Canada. I've looked at drumlins in New York State. I've looked at drumlins in probably a dozen different places. And where you can see exposures, you see stratification. You don't see, if, if glaciers are grinding over a deformable substrate, how is it that they produce anything other than a, a, a chaotic jumble of glacial till? You can actually see layering. Well, I've seen it right. myself, and we can pull up pictures of it here in a minute. And I'd well, like wait, for you to explain to me. Just before you do that, because I'm not disagreeing with you. Okay. A drumman, by definition, is made up of till. I think yes. we're getting kind of technical for this audience, but you know, an esker is something that's stratified, not a drumman. So well, you're you're mis you're misidentifying them as drumlins. No, I am not misidentifying drumlins. I know very clearly the difference between an esker and a drumlin. I've looked at many eskers. I've hiked on but, them. But, I've I've flown over them in airplanes. The Finger Lakes are gouged. They are gouged. Yes. Are they gouged by glaciers or are they also gouged by subglacial mega floods? That's well, the question, and that I think that's a fair question to ask. And if we look at I, some of the studies, we find out that the that the depositional material in them is massive. It's not stratified. It's massive, as if it was dumped in there over a very short period of time. Let me go back to the uh, to, to the bigger picture. But hold on um, a second. What, but, but what's what's to, your point about that? Uh, well, was, sorry, Joe, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Respond to that. What he just said. What am I responding to? Oh. Uh, look, we're going to have to disagree. I mean, what am I supposed to argue? I don't want to get in an argument with him here. He thinks that they're done by water. I think that the, traditionally the way most geologists see the grit, the Finger Lakes is they're gouged out. 
They're parallel to one another. If, if he thinks it's water, okay, what can we do? We can disagree, I guess. Well, I, Let me go back up to the, to the main glacier, uh, the Laurenti Glacier. Wally Broker uh, suggested in, nine, in the 90s uh, that water uh, potentially uh, was changed from flowing down the Mississippi Valley uh, into the Atlantic or the Arctic. No one has been able to find any evidence of flooding towards the Atlantic or the Arctic. So when you say there are all kinds of evidence of flooding up there, Wally, Wally Broker backed off of his of his theory because we couldn't find any flooding. Up what there. he backed off of was the, the idea that the draining of Glacial Lake Agassiz triggered the Younger Dryas. Because Look, the, 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 the dating of the draining of Glacial Lake Agassiz was post-Younger Dryas. And so that's what he backed off of. He didn't necessarily well, he back off. Look, we know uh, that, that there were, that in, there were that somewhere around... The rains around. have been carefully... Uh, they can carefully map. You can watch the Laurenti Glacier move back moraine after moraine, and there are no holes in that moraine that, that suggest flooding. There's no change in the lake level of Lake Agassiz. There's no evidence there, uh, Randall, for flooding. You've got it wrong if you look at the mapping, that the careful mapping that the geologists have done. You've just said that there was no change in the level of Lake Agassiz. How, how is that possible? I mean, as the ice receded, the glacial Lake Agassiz expanded, and at some point it finally breached uh, right there at, at by Big Stone Lake in Minnesota and, and basically carved out uh, the Minnesota River Valley, which geological studies have confirmed, they called Gla uh, River Warren, and have confirmed that essentially it was carrying its peak discharge was roughly 4,000 times greater than the modern Minnesota River that flows there. And where did oh, that end up? That flowed into the Mississippi. The Mississippi then can conveyed that water into the Gulf of Mexico and deposited right. huge amounts of, of delta material that New Orleans is built on now. You know, you're trying to make a flood where a flood isn't. There's a difference between a glacier melting, which causes a lot of water, and a comet striking it, which creates, uh, that creates copious amounts of water. I think you guys referred to it the last time as a tsunami. There's no evidence of a tsunami in North America. Have, have you been... And by the way, here's another question. Why do you guys... Why are you guys talking about North America when your Atlantis is supposed to be in Egypt or, or you guys have run around, you found some evidence of flooding in North America and somehow this relates to uh, a, a destruction of Atlantis in some lost civilization. Well, that's not Randall. That's, 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 that's not what I'm talking about right now. I'm not talking about that. We know there was a Fenoscandian ice sheet. We know there was a Cordilleran ice sheet. We know there was a Laurentide ice sheet. We know they yeah. all melted. We know that there was somewhere around 6 million cubic miles of ice wrapped up in those uh, in those ice sheets at the end of the uh, at the late glacial maximum. They're all gone now. They had to melt. That was an enormous amount of water. And I don't know if you have been out to the Scablands. I've been going back to the Scablands and the area of Glacial Lake, Lake Missoula since 1970. I've been across that thing 60,000 miles back and forth. I have over 10,000 photographs of the material in the field, and I can tell you those floods were enormous. They were beyond... Yeah, you're cherry-picking. Look at the map. You've shown some pictures. You know, we can measure those current ripple marks that you show. We can measure how much water went over them. All you have to do is measure the yeah. current ripples. You can go into Camas Prairie, and you've got a current ripple field there that is about seven miles long. The oh, I know. I know it very well. Okay. And the high water mark in there is at 4,200 feet above sea level. The floor of Camas Prairie is just 1,400 feet lower than that. So we know that there were 1,400 feet of water that passed through Camas Prairie and down into the Flathead no, River. No, 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 we don't. I, well, because then are you disregarding the, the are you disregarding the high water marks from the bottom of from the bottom of the canyon to the top of the canyon is not what it was when the water first started flowing in that area. You can't take the bottom of the canyon and say, oh, there must have been 4,000 feet of water here. I'm not talking about a canyon. I'm talking about Camas Prairie Basin, which is not a canyon. It's a basin. Well, it had to erode at one time. Well, most of the material in there was washed in. So, I mean, we don't know how much it would have eroded until somebody does some core samples to get down to something that can be dated to earlier you know, than the late glacial maximum. But the floor of Camas Prairie is is thick layers of very coarse gravel, boulders, and this is what composes the, the, the current ripples that you see there. 
I mean, I, I don't see how you can look at those current ripples that are sometimes 40 and 50 feet in amplitude with two and 300 feet cord lengths and say that that wasn't a catastrophic flow. Maybe well, it wasn't. It was, for, a, it was a catastrophic flood, but it wasn't like a tsunami. Well, it then how would like you characterize it? And, and, and we can, you know, we can do, we are, can play this game. Are you saying there, are, there that, are, are, every geologist on the planet practically says that there were about 40 different floods until you came along. No, no, and, oh, and no, oh, no. You're, trying you're, to you're obviously from, not told you familiar, you're not familiar with the work then of Victor Baker or Russell Bunker or a number of others that have challenged the 40 floods hypothesis. And, and are you going to tell floods. me that those well, current not, ripples in Camas Prairie are created, they're, they're the product of 40 separate floods? Oh, absolutely. In fact, when you showed <laughs> one of your pictures, I could see the flow changes in that. Oh, don't give me the, the your incredulous stuff. I'm Being sorry. Being incredulous I, doesn't well, mean you're right. You do, you do the incredulous all the time, Mark. Well, so well, that's because so you say some pretty incredulous things. 40 man. floods created the Camas Prairie. I want, that's what you're saying. That's for, that's the product of forty separate floods. Those current ripples. I don't ripples. know how many floods have been in there. I know that there are they they're going they're counting them. And I and I last read uh, something to the effect of forty somewhere around. Yeah, there. that's based on the work of Richard Waite. Goes back to the to the early eighties, and I think he's got. No, the, go go to go to his graph. Can we go to his graph? Who, who's which graph? Guy? Which graph is this, Mark? Uh, it's the one right below the map. Yeah, this one. It's the dating of okay. the floods. Here we go. We're, Look, we're at that uh, right Randall, now. Randall, I, I, I think we're, I, I hopefully, hopefully we're disagreeing uh, in a, as comrades here rather than I think just so. fighting yeah, yeah, each I, other. I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just trying to give you some data here. Look at those. Uh, those are Missoula floods, uh, Lake, Lake Missoula. He's got them dated. Uh, you're seeing the dates. He's got standard deviations, one and two standard deviations on right. on, on on the median there. Uh, so we've got these these things pinned by multiple carbon dates. The the little bell curves there show how many carbon dates he's got, and, and you can see that that these are documented very very well. Yes. So I don't understand why you're. You're you're so opposed to multiple floods. In fact, I heard in the last time you guys were on this show, I heard you say that you thought there were multiple floods. Now you're trying to argue no, against that idea. What's I am going on? not. I, I'm still. I still think there were multiple floods. I think we have to look at two distinct regimes of floods, though. And 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 as far as the the radiocarbon dating, the thing we have to be really careful of is that floods will entrain older sediment and in that older sediment there could be radiocarbon dated material that doesn't really date the, the time of the flood but was excavated by the flood entrained into flood waters and then redeposited so you know that that's that's a major problem with radiocarbon dating anytime you look at flood sediments and i do believe there were multiple floods that's uh, you know i think it's a misinterpretation to think that i only think that there was one flood but there you know the problem is here I, and i do i think we're colleagues and i my approach to this is just like you know in the mma when two guys get out there and try to beat the crap out of each other and then at the end of it they give each other a hug that's kind of where i'm coming from so you know well, there's nothing I, personal I'm sorry here we couldn't give each other a hug but i feel the same way and by the way, you guys are very bright and and very knowledgeable. Well, you know, I I I I really value this because I'm looking for, you know, I'm looking for holes in this idea, very much so. And and I have done some serious thinking about this over many years, and I have interviewed most of the geologists that have worked on it. I've been in half a dozen field trips guided by the, the, the main geologists that have worked on this and had a chance to dialogue with them. And, and you know, I, I'm convinced that, you know, there's still some, there's a lot to be learned about this. And, and I think we need to be looking at, like you said, the big picture. Um, and, and, you know, we could get back to a discussion of the Finger Lakes and how they formed. I think that's important. I think we could get back to a discussion about drumlins and how they formed. Um, you know, there is studies on the Valley Heads Moraine that are at the south end of uh, the Finger Lakes that have, have, I can't think of who did it right now. I could pull it up, but basically said there it's water deposited. But, but there's a lot of unresolved issues about what happened during this transition, planetary transition out of the last ice age. And I think it's important that we have these discussions, that we have these dialogues, and that we try to get to the bottom of what actually happened without 
you know, imposing too many preconceptions upon our models, because I think we're looking at something very unprecedented here. Um, Randall, I couldn't have said that better. It was well, very well articulated. Let me go back to the big picture, if I could, just for a minute, because I, I want us to, to address something that Graham said earlier, and, and that is that Graham seems to have this idea that, that comets break up all the time. But, but people that understand, um, I, I think, comets and meteorites understand that the, 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 the comet Schumer-Levy or whatever it was that broke up. Schumer-Levy uh, 9. It broke up because of the gravitation of Jupiter. Uh, we would not expect these comets to break up uh, entering into the atmosphere. It's one of the problems that the comet people have had. Mm -hmm. uh, Firestone once suggested a four kilometer wide comet striking them. Now they've broken it up into multiple comets. The problem is you can't get it separated. If a comet breaks up, it's very hard to separate it so that it hits in multiple places. And so, so this is a big picture kind of problem that the comet people are having with the scientists. So you may be able to get it to hit uh, the North American ice sheet, but I'm telling you, um, that the studies are showing that you're not going to be able to do this without leaving some marks. And, and so far, nobody's been able to find a crater. Do you know that, that they're suggesting that a four-kilometer comet, if it could break up, it would generate one million uh, crater, um, meteor craters? You know how big that was? That was 49,000 years ago. We, we don't see that in the, in the climate record. 49,000 years ago, we should see it. We don't see it. It's about a barely a little thing. Malcolm so Lecomte has been standing. We're going to have a huge comet strike. Malcolm Lecomte has been standing by for the best part of three hours. I, I, and since he's a member of the Comet Research Group, wouldn't it be a good time to bring him on? Yeah, we, we can bring him on uh, as long as Mark is satisfied that he said his piece. Uh, but unfortunately, Mark, we can't have uh, two people on the phone at the same time. Okay. Do you well, think, I, I really appreciate you having me on, Joe. I appreciate you coming on, too, and I'm glad you guys, uh, especially you and Randall, seem to have uh, ironed out a lot of your uh, ideas. Well, I think there's, yeah, Randall's a great guy. There's a lot to be learned here, obviously, and there's a lot that already has been learned, and this is an unbelievably fascinating subject. And I think oftentimes when these debates get heated, a lot gets lost in who's wrong or who's right. But I think what we can all agree on is that what we're dealing with is an unbelievable point in history, in the history of this planet. And trying to figure out what caused it and why is uh, some really fascinating stuff. So, Mark, I really appreciate your time and really appreciate well said, Joe. You, you. Uh, you imparting your knowledge on us. And Mark, if, if at all possible, I would love to kind of keep some of this dialogue going because I, I really would value your input. Um, I and, tried to write you, Randall, um, and I couldn't get through. I'm not sure why. Well, I, I'm well, not either because if I would have seen that, I definitely would have responded. So, uh, well, I have a up. website. Please send me. I'd love to keep I will. up with We'll I definitely will. connect you guys um, after this uh, is over. And thank you once again, Mark. Really, really appreciate Mark, you calling you. in. If I can just it. say, I, I do hope you'll revisit your article and just have a look at the context in which you present me there. Absolutely. Never <laughs> meant to insult you. Thank, all right. you. thank you, Mark. Okay. Now, uh, we are going to call caller number two. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, it's a fascinating podcast, though. And uh, your friend who's waiting is... Markham Lecomte. Markham and Lecomte. he's one of the Comet Research Group scientists. Uh, this is a large and diverse body of, of scientists who come at it, the material with different expertise and different areas of knowledge. Uh, it happens that Markham is a co-author of the recent, I regarded highly significant paper, uh, Finding a Platinum Anomaly Across North America. Uh, and I would hope you might begin with, uh, with addressing uh, why that might indicate a, a comet impact. Right. Is Malcolm on? It should be. Malcolm, can you hear us? I, I can hear. Can you hear me? Excellent. How are you, Malcolm? Thank you very much for joining us. I'm happy to be here. Uh, so give us your thoughts on what Graham just said, if you would, uh, as to why uh, why it makes sense that it was a comet that hit and why there would be these uh, large deposits of these, what, what was it exactly? Well, platinum, the in, the, platinum, platinum, platinum in the recent paper, but, but Malcolm is also an expert in magnetic microspherules, and I think he can address okay. that issue as well. And the, the, the whole range of proxies, of impact proxies. Now, Mal and Malcolm, please just give us your thoughts on this entire phenomenon, if you would. I will. Uh, 
happy to be here. Happy to have you. Uh, Is he breaking up? No, go ahead. Go ahead, Malcolm. I think there's an issue. Seems to be yeah. a bit... Can you oh, hear? I, I know what's going on. I've got a uh, feedback. I've got to turn off this. Okay. Oh, yeah, you got to mute that uh, other video. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. You're listening to us at the same time as talking to us. Yeah, you're going right. to get... You're, you're getting us on like a 40-second delay or something. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, we cool um, now? Actually, I was very interested to hear Mark's... Uh, his initial statement kind of put me off, but his uh, his subsequent statements I thought were 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 pretty accurate. And uh, there is there are many problems with the the uh, the hypothesis that there was an impact, and that's the way I, I consider it. I don't really think in terms of a comet impact. I think in terms of an extraterrestrial impact, because I don't think we've proven a comet impact. I don't think we've proven we. I don't think we know what kind of an impact it was. There's too many questions that uh, have to be answered. Uh, so. I can't sign up to say that I'm defending the comet impact hypothesis because I don't frankly know what it was. Uh, we have a lot of evidence that appears to be extraterrestrial in nature. We have magnetic microspherals. Uh, I can give you a, the most frequent criticism we get is that the, the evidence has not been replicated. And that's where I thought Mark was going when he, his initial statement was that the comet impact hypothesis has been debunked. And I think what he meant was, if I can speak for him, um, was that the fact that it was a comet has been debunked. I don't think that's necessarily true yet. It just isn't indicated that uh, that it was a comet. It's, we have indications that it was more of an asteroid hit than anything else. And, and I could conceive of a rubble pile that somehow became uh, disassociated, although there'd, be me there'd have to be a mechanism or a model for that, and I don't think we have a model for that. Um, Asteroids come in many flavors, and, and uh, rubble piles are certainly one. Loose, loose aggregates of material that could become separated, possibly. But uh, I just don't, you know, I just don't know at this stage. Um, I guess the uh, the biggest criticism that we faced in terms of of the impact hypothesis is that the evidence has not been replicable, and we now have. I guess four, three or four uh, l evidence lines that have been replicated by numerous independent groups. If you look at the nano diamonds, which may be the most controversial of the bunch of, of the evidence lines, that's been that's been replicated by four different groups, independent, uh, five different studies. The magnetic microspherals, which were initially uh, treated very hostily because they didn't understand what we were talking about. And some of that was a self-inflicted wound on the part of the initial study, uh, which didn't show what we, what we really were finding. And uh, that's been corrected. And there's, if this, the same objection or criticism is being made, magnetic microspherals are typically very, well, they're melted and then they're quenched. Uh, they, they, they're subjected to high temperatures, and then those temperatures are, are rapidly reduced, which is sort of accepted to be characteristics of an impact. So we've got that evidence of an impact, and that's been replicated by 10 different independent groups, and uh, including many of the same sites that, uh, that were originally disputed. So then the, dis the disputation has been largely based upon the failure to do the most basic part of the of the protocol which is to uh, to do the, the scanning electron microscopic analysis of the spherules okay that that is the uh, the microspherules and the, and the nano diamonds the other is the discovery of platinum iridium or osmium which are the platinum group elements which are characteristic of an asteroid impact and we found some evidence of of, of iridium not not a lot, but there have been certain sites that are rich in iridium. At the, and once again, this is at the younger driest boundary, not above, not below. It's there at that boundary. So that date seems to be pretty solid. And iridium is and, in indicative of uh, an impact of extraterrestrial origin, correct? That's correct. The platinum is simply just another more, more plentiful uh, platinum group element. Obviously, that's why they're called the platinum groups. Uh, osmium is one that is usually associated with iridium. There are now 11 studies by independent groups that have confirmed the uh, 
the occurrence of platinum, osmium, or iridium. So it looks to me like the evidence is piling up. Uh, the most recent one, of course, is the platinum study by Moore that just came out uh, a few months ago. Now, Randall and, Carlson just, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but Randall Carlson just had us pull up uh, some images that we're looking at. Randall, please explain what this is. Well, this is from uh, Malcolm's 2012 um, independent evaluation of conflicting microspheral results from different investigations. This is his uh, supplementary in, uh, information figure four. So it's just so that, that the people watching this can, can actually see what you're talking about when you're... Um, discussing the rapid quenching effect on the surface of the microspherals. So, so we've got up on the screen here um, supplementary uh, information figure four, where you've got the microspherals from Topper, Blackwater Draw, and Pawpaw Cove. So just, just so people can see what that surface texture looks like. Uh, yeah, you see these, they look like leaf-like structures Mm -hmm. uh, across, the, some of them are harder to see, but they're there. If you see the original image, it's large enough and clear enough to, to actually see these, what we call dendritic structures or or uh, almost like a carpet uh, weave. Mm -hmm. uh, those are essentially truncated crystallization. It's, uh, it's a crystallization process that's quenched. I'm not a geologist. Uh, I've had geologists try to explain it to me, and uh, that's what I'm trying to do here. But uh, yeah, the... Uh, the fact that these are enhanced, these, these things are quite enhanced at the Ember Dryas and really depleted above and below. Now, there are spherules throughout the column. Any column of, of soil, uh, when you go down vertically uh, deeper, you find spherules. But those spherules are typically what we call orthogenic, which means that they're created by terrestrial processes. You need to do a scanning electron microscope and um, X-ray uh, dispersive uh, spectroscopy to differentiate those from the, uh, the terrestrial processes that are producing these things. Yeah, your figure five has a, a, a framboidal spheral, which is probably what you're talking about. If you could go to slide 113, Jamie, and, and you'll be able to see, yeah, there it is. You can see very distinct difference. So we've got your figure five up in the screen now, Malcolm. Um, the yeah, that's a typical framboid, and yep. they're, when, when you look at an optical microscope, they look just like the, or very much like the, uh, uh, the, the what we call impact spherules or magnetic microspherules, and they occur much more frequently. I mean, I've got, I've got sites that have tens of thousands of these things in every couple of centimeters of, of sediment. So you've got to separate the, uh, the, 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 the impact spherules or the magnetic microspherules from these things. But what you appear and to be saying, Malcolm, is that there is an abundance of impact proxy evidence, which in your opinion adds up to a cosmic impact of some sort, not necessarily a comet, you're suggesting an asteroid, it's a mysterious event in that sense, but what it adds up to is an impact in your view. Um, is that a fair Yeah. A fair All these, pro what we call proxies, the, the impact spherules, the uh, platinum group elements, the, uh, the melt glass, which I haven't discussed yet, and the nano diamonds are enhanced, and the enhancement has been replicated on numerous occasions for each of these these proxies. So anyone who and says that that the work of you and your team has been completely debunked is is clearly not completely familiar with the literature. Then that's that would seem to be the case. That or were uh, disingenuous in that regard. We have so I would say that that uh, because typically what we see is that the the, the, uh, the opposition literature does not cite the studies that have come out. Yeah. We try and cite both the critical studies and ours and give reasons why our studies supplant theirs. And Jamie? that's a habit I wish they would share. Yeah. But uh, Could you go that to hasn't been the case. Slide 82. It would be nice if we could have had you on with Mark so you guys could exchange information. But unfortunately, our capability is that we can only take one phone call at a time. Uh, we will definitely try to update that for the new studio, although we never anticipated this was going to happen in the first place. But uh, it's All been right. awesome. Oh, there we go. Up on the screen, uh, Malcolm, we've got um, from from Ted Bunch at, at Al, 2012, very high temperature impact melt products as evidence for cosmic air bursts and impacts 12,900 years ago. Uh, so we have figure uh, from supplementary information uh, six, 
the light photo micrographs of magnetic and glassy spherules from Melrose, Pennsylvania. And it shows the, the, the wide variety of shapes, which includes spherules, ovals, teardrops, and dumbbells. Um, and I think, so you can see pretty distinctly what you're talking about here with the, with the glassy spherules. Um, and then, like particularly, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if you were co-author of this paper or not. I was um, not. You are not. Okay. Are you familiar with that paper? Do you know the yes, image? Yes, I am. Good. Okay. Yeah, it shows some very interesting, you know, teardrop shapes, dumbbell shapes, and where you can actually see that, um, like, dumbbell H up there consists of two dissimilar accretionary spherules, one clear silicon-rich and the other opaque iron-rich that have been fused together. And that's, that's pretty convincing evidence of the, of the energy that's involved in these phenomena, um, that you actually have these fused spherules like this. And then, Jamie, if you go down to the next image, uh, which is a scanning electron microscope images comparing younger dry boundary spherules on the top row with known impact spherules on the bottom row. This is a very interesting comparison because, and I, you've probably seen this one, Malcolm, A, uh, there's, there's three across the top, three across the bottom, and A is actually a... Um, from Nudson's or Nudson's farm in Canada. It's a young a Cretaceous tertiary boundary spheral. And just below it is a younger Dryas spheral from Lake Cuzio in Mexico. And one can see the morphological similarity of the two quite clearly. Then C and D compares, uh, C is a, uh, a spheral from the Tunguska airburst. And then D is younger Dryas boundary from Lingen, Germany, which dates to 12,800 years before present. And there you can see very clearly the, 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 the rapid quench melt uh, texture on the surface between the two comparison, comparing Tunguska airburst with um, a younger driest boundary object. And then finally E and F, we have uh, uh, an iron calcium silica spheral from Meteor Crater compared with uh, uh, an iron calcium silica younger driest boundary spheral from Abu Haria, Syria. And again, in each of these cases, you can see the similarities between the different types of objects. So you have these three objects which are come from that younger driest boundary layer, all which have morphological similarity to known impact proxies. And this is very difficult to dismiss this as being mere coincidence. Yeah, I would agree. And uh, those those are very, especially the A, C, B, and D uh, pictures are very similar to the material that I'm taking out of the Younger Dryas boundary at the sites that I've been looking at. Uh huh. Malcolm, what evidence, if any, uh, do you, are you aware of about what is that nuclear glass material called? Tri tritonite. Trinitite. 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 That's how you say it. What, yeah. I, I, from what I understand, there's quite a bit of that that also appears in the, in the same time period in the core samples. There are some instances of it, but I wouldn't say quite a bit. Uh, some of these, I mean, they're very site specific, and one of the one of the things I've been trying to do is work my way closer and closer to Canada to see if there's any truth to the to this whole uh, idea that the primary impact site was Canada. So I've been trying to look at sites closer and closer, and I've seen sites in New Jersey. This would be eastern Canada. I've seen sites in New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania that produce uh, what appears to be some form of trinitite or, or melt glass, uh, or what uh, Ted Bunch uh, would call scoria-like objects. And it seems to, to, uh, to bear out that, that uh, at least that far, uh, we're getting richer material out of the sediment, out of the younger driest boundary sediment. And yeah, is this but, trinitite, this material only produced in this manner? Or it's also produced through nuclear explosion tests, right? But it, other than that, is this the only way that it's produced on Earth? Well, an impact would do it, uh, or a fulgurite could do it. Uh, a what fulgurite is, is, is what's produced by a, uh, light, uh, a lightning strike could ah. uh, produce uh, a... Uh, spherules it could produce all the high temperature products that you see in an impact uh, but in a very limited way you wouldn't expect to see it in a, in a layer unless there was some sort of global lightning storm um, the uh, what I was, was going to say about the uh, the melt glass is that in in the, the material we're looking at you see evidence of, of melted uh, zircons melted chromite all of which are very high temperature uh, features High, indicating a very high temperature that was experienced by that particular object. Are, are you seeing the image we have up here? Yeah. 
Yes, I am. Oh, great. Okay, good. Yeah, their A is from Meteor Crater, and B is from the Trinity Nuclear Test. So, and then uh, with the 22 kiloton yield, and then C is from one of the Soviet era nuclear tests, and D is again a scoria like object from uh, Abu Huria. So, yeah. So, and then if we go to, uh, let's see. Um, you gotta love that it says Stalinite. Yeah. Go, 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 <laughs> yeah. The scoria like objects, the, uh, the melt glass or scoria like objects, has only been found in about half a dozen sites to this point. Uh, so we're still, you know, and I think it's a matter of how close you are to an impact point. And if they're very far mm. apart, that would lend credence, I think, to the, this idea of multiple impacts. If they seem to be get more, you know, more plentiful as you get further and further north, then maybe there's more, more legitimacy to, uh, to a primary impact site. Uh, right now, we just don't know. You know, we're still, we're, 90. we're still working that out. All right, we got another nice slide from from the bunch article here. Uh, the you, the beautiful cal slide, yeah. yeah that's, calcium that's oxide rich scoria like object created by the melting of carbonate and silica rich precursor rocks. The yellow area is the calcium oxide. The white area is Le Chatelierite, and dark areas are iron oxide. So that's a really Carbon. nice. Yeah, let's tell you right. Yeah, I've been struggling with getting that <laughs> pronunciation <laughs> down. Um, and then, Jamie, if you go to the next one, we will see uh, there's a scoria-like object from Meteor Crater, Arizona. And you could toggle back and forth between the two so the people can kind of see the similarity between them. Yeah. Um, and I see a lot. That's when I In the sites that produce melt glass, that's what I'm seeing. Yeah. Those two, those two types of... Uh, Particulates. And how much of this material are you finding in these sites? Well, you don't find, I have to say, you don't find a lot of this material. It takes, it's a struggle to get it. But what you don't find is anything above or below it, that particular layer. Uh, unless you know that it's been a very dynamic environment, in which case it can be spread out uh, in, the, in the soil column. And what's the implication of nothing above it and below it? Well, that, that uh, you've got a specific date for a specific date for it. And uh, the layer that we we typically try and just limit our investigation to layers that have been dated to the yeah. Younger Dryas boundary or right. contain the Younger Dryas boundary layer. Right. But like I say, if you have a very dynamic environment, it can really screw things up. Uh, it can be very difficult to interpret. So this if is you've difficult. You've got a lot of flooding, repetitive flooding. Difficult uh, science to do. Say again. This is difficult science to do. Uh, yeah, and and uh, I should add there that. Proving an impact is not easy. It takes a while, and and it just as proving an impact crater is not easy, you know, as, as I'm sure Mark would agree that you find a crater, there's no guarantee that it's either an impact impact uh, event or a, or a volcanic event until you do the research and spend the time to investigate it. But if you could summarize for us, what's your opinion now on the balance of the evidence, always bearing in mind that you may change that opinion as more evidence comes in? Yeah, I would say we've, we're facing an unprecedented type of event here that appears to have been uh, something approaching global. I mean, we've got evidence now in South America. We've got evidence, uh, and a lot of this stuff is unpublished. I mean, I, there's a lot of things that, that I could bring up that aren't published, so that it's kind of useless to, to refer to them because there's no way of checking what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing stuff that goes very far into South America, uh, and we're seeing things in Syria. We haven't looked elsewhere. We've seen it out in the Pacific Ocean. We've seen it uh, in Europe. So, I mean, where does it end? And right it's now, all we haven't it, found an end to it yet. And it's all at the Younger Dryas boundary. That's correct. Yeah. What have you found in the Pacific Ocean? Uh, well, Sharma has found, so it, there's a paper I can cite from his, his uh, it may even be just a presentation. Uh, I can quote it. He says, we infer that the Central Pacific was a site of deposition of osmium resulting from dust from dust cloud falling a meteorite impact at 12,000 12, kiloanoms plus or minus 4,000. So right in, that, right in that ballpark, Sharma says that uh, he found osmium, and I believe he's, he's come up with microspherals from that, that same core. But uh, so the Central Pacific is an idea that or gives you an idea of how extensive this this thing was. Now, Malcolm, this is obviously some controversial material. It's uh, it's it's fairly new in terms of the public consciousness. Have you had anybody debate you on this or have you had anybody oppose you? Yeah. 
it goes with it, it goes with the territory. <laughs> I I wish the uh, the opposition in, in some respects in some cases I wish the opposition was of a bit higher caliber than than what I've seen. I think it's uh, it's been a sad state that uh, the most virulent opposition has not. But I have I haven't regarded it as particularly high high quality. Uh, Ma- Malcolm uh, Michael Shermer here. Just uh, um, do you have an opinion on? Uh, the the association of the impact with the megafauna extinction and also then Graham's hypothesis about the uh, you know extinction of this lost civilization. I <laughs> the uh, I won't even comment on the lost civilization aspects of this. I have a hard enough time dealing with the meteorite impact. Uh, <laughs> as far as the megafauna goes, I I think that uh, I guess I I would say all of the above. I think that all these these factors came into play. You've got uh, humans who are, you know, for that period, technologically advanced with, with uh, the Clovis point and the uh, the atlatl and, and the spear, uh, the, uh, the replaceable uh, spear tip that uh, must have been devastating to the fauna. But the, the idea of attacking a, a, a proboscinian to me is almost unthinkable. I mean, those things are... Today, if you don't have a high-powered rifle, uh, I just don't see... How you you realistically go up against a, a, a bull elephant? I mean, it just strikes me as far too dangerous to take on. But uh, there are aspects of that question that I think are going to be very very interestingly debated in the next the next couple of years or so. We have a book coming out that addresses that directly at one of the sites I've been researching. That uh, the whole extinction of the megafauna may have been as much related to religion as something else. There may have been a religion built around the extinction of the megafauna. No, uh, how so? That's Well, that <laughs> you'd, you'd want the evidence for that, and that, that evidence will be coming out in a book and that's going to be published in about a month or two. Oh. I could speak so, to the whole idea of uh, hunting bull elephants, though, unfortunately. People have been hunting them with bows and arrows forever. Uh, it's not an atlatl. Atlatl is less effective. You get less range, but uh, people hunt with not just modern compound bows, which are very powerful, which would allow you to shoot it from 100 yards away, but with long bows. They've been hunting elephants with bows and arrows for a long time. You know, especially the thing with woolly mammoths was that they would go after the females, apparently, according to uh, Dan Flores, who wrote American Serengeti, and that the females would keep the young in their body. Their gestation period was very long. Like, I believe he said it was two years. Is that correct? I think he said it was two years. And so it made them extremely vulnerable. When they were pregnant, obviously, if you kill off the females that are pregnant, you're killing off a substantial part of the breeding population, and the population suffers tremendously. So that was one. But it also could have been that end. You know, I mean, that uh, humans, I'm sure, had an impact on uh, virtually anything that we could eat when we were starving. But whether or not we wipe them out, the Blitzkrieg hypothesis, there's a lot of holes in that theory, according to uh, a, a lot of people that have studied it. Well, I think if you have, a, you know, if you have an environmental impact uh, or a, uh, a degradation of the environment that might follow a, a, a significant impact, you know, extraterrestrial impact, so you're, you're reducing the population or stressing the population of megafauna that way, and then you've got a population of hunters in addition to that, especially if they're, for some reason or other, focused on hunting uh, proboscinians, and when the, when the number gets limited, they don't care whether it's a female or a male and they go after whatever they can get, then I think the population of megafauna is going to suffer. So I think it's a combination of factors, not necessarily just one. Yeah, I think that's very reasonable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Malcolm, is there anything else that you would like to add before we let you go? Uh, no, I, I, I guess one thing is the interest. I found it interesting in the discussion of uh, the, uh, the scab lands, and, and uh, that was really, it was looking at the scab lands from, from flying over them when I was a, a young naval officer that uh, got me interested in science and why I pursued science. It was looking at that, the catastrophes that were etched in the landscape there, uh, the catastrophic floods that really caused me to pursue a, a, a career in science. It's really a remarkable landscape. Uh, that's just a personal observation. 
Well, Mar- we're very, very thankful for your time, and we really, really appreciate your input here, and it means a lot. And, and thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for everything that you continue to do to highlight this. It is such a fascinating subject, and it's so amazing, and uh, it's just without someone like you presenting hard data and science, it would definitely be lost. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Yeah, thank you, Malcolm. Malcolm. All right, Malcolm, we're going to let you go. Okay. Take it easy, buddy. Sound down. <laughs> Time for your nap, Malcolm. <laughs> it's a lot of energy. So these podcasts are long. I mean, four hours. The guy was sitting there on standby, probably, you know, yeah. chomping at the bit. Um, Jamie, before we go, I want to see some pictures of the Scablands, because that is pretty amazing stuff. And Randall, one more thing before we go. Um, one thing that you pointed out to me during one of the episodes that was so stunning was these woolly mammoths that had been literally knocked over by an impact with broken legs and that died on the spot. Do you have those images? I do. That was actually a mastodon. Mastodon, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I want to see those. So let's go to the Scablands first so we can show the uh, audience on YouTube, which is, by the way, only about 10% of the people that watch this. So if you're listening to this, go check out the uh, Scablands on, uh, on Google. And you could see this. Uh, describe it to us, Randall. Well, here we're. This is um, textbook scab land right here. Um, let's see what this is. Probably Rock Lake or Sprague Lake in the Cheney Palouse scab lands. Um, yeah, you see the potholes there. That's a, a sign of turbulence, extreme turbulence uh, within the water. Um, Colking is then is what the process is called where you get it's so turbulent that it actually produces Vortexes high intensity vortex motion in the water. It'll pick up sediment and then it can drill its way right into the into the bedrock um, Going down there. Uh, that's Palouse Falls, which wow. we, was it, it, it said that's an underfit waterfall because what you have to realize is that at the peak of the flooding this entire scene was submerged below water and the cataract here is an extinct feature and the flow over here was thousands of times greater than the present uh, Palouse River that you see right there um, we've got a lot of great pictures up on the geocosmic rex website and some awesome video clips um and our Geo, last i'm scared, sorry, sorry, geocosmic rex r-e-x rex okay and, and i thought you were saying wreck like a car wreck well that's it's a play on words oh okay see um so yeah we are talking about that okay but um yeah and we got some great drone footage on there I, did we show that last time i, I was don't here? believe we did we oh, might have. Did I think we? we showed a bit of oh, yeah, the um, the Camas Prairie ripples? Did we show potholes, there. cataract? Um, yeah, there, yeah. This this whole scabland thing is has literally fascinated me since 1970, and um, and like Malcolm, I, I think that summer of 1970, traveling out in some of these landscapes was. Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, this is the drone footage. Wow. That's sh- incredible. Yeah, and and let's see. Be ready to pause you, if we need to here. Um, is this the beginning? Because at the beginning we have a Google Earth image, so you there. can get a sense of what we're looking at here. Go go back to the beginning, right at the very beginning. Let's see if it starts off with the drone. Oh, it starts off with the drone. Okay, there should be another one that actually. That's okay. This is pretty cool. Yeah, this is this is <laughs> these are four hundred foot cliffs. This was a wow. um, recessional cataract, very similar to Dry Falls. The water was pouring, coming from behind our view here. Where is this specifically? If anybody wanted to go watch this or look at this area, oh, the actual area. Yeah. This is yeah. in eastern Washington. What, this is where this is on the eastern rim of Quincy Basin. It's called. It's right along, just. If you can see up there um, where those cliffs are in the middle distance, mm-hmm. right below there is the Columbia River. Uh-huh. And this is just north of Wenatchee, Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin, Washington. Um, so basically what we had here was a, you know, plucking, uh, quarrying as the water poured over this ridge. This is the Babcock Ridge, and behind us is the Quincy Basin, which served as a temporary holding pond. And let's see, is the... Is the um, drone comes around i'm looking for the um for the team oh 
Uh, keep going. Zoom in a little bit more there, Jamie. Oh, yeah, I think we did show this. You can see you guys down there on the ground, right? Yeah, we're in there somewhere lost in the vastness of the... Um, yeah, now I remember we did show this. Yeah. What about those images of the, the, the Mastodons? Let's look at those, and then let's get out of here. Okay. Um, for that, you have to go to the world of the Pleistocene. On the OS. Which I just should have given you. That sounds like an amusement park. Yeah. The world of the Pleistocene. Could be a go winner. There and some dudes with animal skins on them. Well, maybe if they succeed sticks. in um, you know, cloning some of those flash-frozen yeah. animals up there. Maybe They're really we, we, talking we about doing Pleist that, right? Ple yeah, I don't know how plausible that, it is, but... That hey. seems like a terrible idea. The lost world <laughs> what, what of the Pleistocene. Wrong? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> it's not like there's any diseases. Well, that's one of the big concerns about climate change, right? That we're going to release some... Um, <clears throat> Diseases that we don't have an immune system for? Yep. Go to uh, slide 78. This is a good example of... By the way, who is more thoroughly documented than Randall Carlson? I mean, <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. Go to f slide 6,222. <laughs> 50 plus years of walking yeah. the walk in the Channel Scablands. Uh, yeah, this, this is a bone deposit. Um, and what happens is that in the particularly warm years when the... Um, the permafrost around the rivers collapses, it exposes these huge deposits of bones, which have been buried in the permafrost. This is, you know, when I look at stuff like this, this is, I, is why I say there had to be another mechanisms of extinction besides human hunting. Um, because this pile? Yeah, because... But is it possible that this, I mean, it's not necessarily at the bottom of a cliff, right? Because you know that they pushed a lot of them off cliffs. And yeah, no, they, no, this, this is stuff that... When the, the river floods, it erodes the banks, and then this stuff falls out of the river banks. Right. So it's, it's been locked into the permafrost for however many thousands of years. And it seems like there's interestingly two peaks of dates that one uh, right around 13,000 and the other one around 36,000 that, that, the, um, that, the, that the fossilized remains are dating to. Which could point to a p potentially that there was some sort of an impact back then as well, mm, or something else, some sort who of an knows? event. I, I, I don't know. I don't have an opinion on that. But by having all these together, I mean, has it been theorized that perhaps this was at the... There's not a cliff near this, right? Yeah, just off the, the to the right. So uh, there is a cliff? See, there is a cliff. We're at the bottom of a cliff right mm -hmm. here that is the... Actually, it's a river bank. So, so just off... Well, you the, know that that was a hunting method. They used to storm them off the side of cliffs, and they never... They, they yeah. literally couldn't even eat all of them. Like head smashed in, yeah. buffalo head smashed they in. Would, yeah. They would run so many of them off cliffs that... Yeah, but, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. When you look at, at, at the, the, the more, these mortality events of modern animals, even like looking at elephants that, that perished during some of the severe droughts in the 80s in Africa, taphonomic studies show that it doesn't take three, four, five years before the, the remains have completely disappeared. Mm. Um, in order to preserve a fossil, it has to be rapidly removed from any kind of forces, oxidation or scavengers right. or anything that would consume it, see? This stuff has been, again, it's been frozen in the permafrost for, for however many years, 10 or 12 or 15,000 years. So it was likely covered in an event. Covered in an event, yes. Now, what, there was one that I really wanted you to get to that was a, a mastodon that had been literally knocked over and had broken legs. Yeah, that would be, um, we could look very quickly at slide 92. <laughs> this is one of the more interesting anomalous events this was the um the flash frozen woolly mammoth um go to the go to slide 93 it's a much clearer yeah this was um a okay, mammoth six ton mammoth that was again one of these river collapses the banks collapsed during a warm spring and exposed this uh remains of a woolly mammoth um with soft tissue preserved uh contents of the food in its stomach undigested actually a mouthful of food the hips of the mammoth were, were both broken, as if he was thrown back on his haunches very violently. Um, he had an erect penis, which suggests to uh, that he was suffocated. Which or is he, a, he was a freak. Or he was a freak, <laughs> yeah. He was getting ready. <laughs> Michael laughs at that. That's <laughs> um, the wolves ate the, the flesh off the skull. That's why it's, it's uh, buried like that. You'll see the front left forelimb there. You'll see... The bottom there, left, right at the center of the screen, that's his back leg oh, that, wow. you, that you see right there. Um, the interesting thing about this is, uh, you know, the, the, the 
rapidity of climate change that's implied by being able to freeze a six-ton mammoth because the contents of his stomach, according to the studies, had not really even putrefied yet, which implies that the entire carcass had been frozen through and through probably in less than 10 hours. Um, well, like Itzy, the Iceman, that's, you know, that's what happened to him. That's exactly what happened to him, yes. Yeah, interesting point, and that would be a subject that we should talk about. And he but fell in between a crevice and a glacier, correct? Yeah, and probably got rapidly buried under the, under the snow and the ice, and that's mm, how he ended overnight, up being preserved. Yeah, yeah right. overnight, exactly. The next slide actually shows a reconstruction of the, of the, right. in, in, the uh, in a museum in Russia, showing what the, the uh, mammoth, the circumstances under which he was found. If you go to, let's and see. By the way, as a sidebar on Utsi, uh, to show you how uh, science changes rather slowly sometimes, it was a decade before they found out he was murdered because they found arrow point in his sca uh, scapula here that mm -hmm. cut his uh, bone. And he had uh, defensive wounds on his hands and arms, mm -hmm. so he'd gotten in a fight, and he had other people's bloods uh, uh, on his hands, so he gave as good as he got wow. and lost a fight, so he was murdered. Wow. Yeah. And that, that took, uh, with all that careful observation in mm -hmm. laboratories, uh, 10 years mm -hmm. before that came out. Yeah, fascinating. So, so stuff. sometimes this stuff has to just take a while. So if I can try to find some common ground with before we sign off with Graham, um, you know your uh, you know your book. You have this really great sentence that I quote: "This it would mean at least that some yet unknown and identified people somewhere in the world had already mastered all the arts and attributes of a high civilization more than twelve thousand years ago, and sent out emissaries around the world." Okay, I think that's is entirely possible cognitively for sure. Mm. Um, and, it, you know, I, what would do it for me, what, you know, the boats that they sent the emissaries out on, the wood, carbon-14 dated, um, and, and some specific examples of high uh, arts and attributes of high civilization. So if it's not metal and writing, then, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. I would change my mind. Absolutely. That's good to hear, Michael. And I, I think as the, as the research continues in this area, for the last few years, um, <laughs> having been very much an, an, an outsider, I, I have felt that the evidence is moving in a direction that is helpful to the argument that I make. I hope it'll continue to be that way. I hope the evidence that you're looking for will, will, will come well, out. But in, I'm, in the I'm trying to, like I say, my, my, my role is a reporter, and I'm trying to be a reporter for the alternative sides of things. But to do so, to do so in an effective and, and, and hopefully thoroughly There's a good argument way. in the history of science to be made for the role of outsiders. I mean, complete outsiders uh, to come in and shake things up. I mean, Freeman Dyson is an example. You know, yeah. totally self-taught, autodidact. I called mm -hmm. you an autodidact, absolutely. Yeah. And they can make. And if nothing else, they push people yeah. to really figure out what it is they believe and why, because otherwise, no one's going to challenge them. So, Harlan Bretz is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, a high school teacher. Right. And right. how about Randall Carlson? He's a good example well, of that, uh, too. Absolutely. We'll see. <laughs> <Excellent example. laughs> well, listen. Do you still want to look at this real quick? The sure. Mastodon? I got absolutely. it right here. Let's do um, it. He, he could go for days. <laughs> That's what I love about Randall. Jamie. He never gets tired of this stuff. <laughs> if you could bottle your enthusiasm, it would be an awesome pill. <laughs> Well, maybe we can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in the memory uh, focus there. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're going we're gonna to look at this, this Mastodon here. Um, 125? 125, yeah. So this is a mastodon that was dug up in a pit years ago. Um, excavation showed that the bones were lying on and in a layer of limey clay or marl, about one foot in thickness. Um, when, the, when it gets up there and it goes on to say, the skeleton proved to be badly disturbed and the bones crushed and broken. As an example of the amount of disturbance, one of the ribs lay beneath one of the tusks while another was thrust through an aperture in the pelvis. A shoulder blade rested to the right of the skull, and one of the large neck vertebrae was found about 10 feet from the skull, near a portion of the pelvis. In spite of the wide dislocation of the parts, the, now this is where it really is interesting, the bones of one of the feet remained intact and in place, very possibly in the spot where the animal last stepped. So in other words, the foot, there was a foot still embedded in the soft material where he was apparently stepping at the time whatever happened to him. Um, and this is all the same time period as the other Mastodon? We don't have dating on this, um, but it, it likely was at the very end, 
probably right in that younger driest window because of the amount of sediment over it. Go to the next slide, Jamie, and we'll see 126. We can get a better so view. So this thing, uh, theoretically at least, was blown back. Yeah. Go to, there we go. There you can see one of the femurs that's been busted squarely across. Um, they go on to say that uh, even the largest of the bones, such as the thigh bones, were broken squarely across in places, indicating that some considerable force had been exerted upon them. Any conclusion as to an agency powerful enough to cause such destruction must be highly speculative. So, basically, what you're seeing here is a mastodon that got <laughs> smashed into the into the ground. Wow. The the forces. There were strong, powerful shear forces that would have literally separated his leg from the foot that's still in, immersed into the, into the ground. So, I mean, there are many examples of this. And the, the last slide we're going to show, if you go back, this, I promise. You know, I once went uh, uh, digging with Jack Horner, the paleontologist, the dinosaur digger, mm -hmm. and he, he showed these um, debris flow uh, pileups of dinosaur bones that had been splintered and broken. Wow. Uh, and these are huge, uh, yeah. just from the force of the water and then piling up at the, at the, uh, of a wall. And, uh, so if we could do it to a dinosaur. Wow. Right. Yeah. 80, 85. <clears throat> 85 is an interesting slide because what it shows is the London ivory docks, which over a period of about two centuries, Whoa. this was, um, this was uh, mammoth ivory that's being dug out of the Siberian permafrost. That's just a drawing. Oh, that's just a drawing, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's the problem with that. Like, that's what it looked like. Um, well, this sure, is what it bro? looked like. A 19th sure, century bro? scene showing the ivory floor of the London docks covered by thousands of mammoth tusks. And this went on year after year after year after year for roughly two centuries. There is so much of that mammoth ivory, by the way, that they use it to make knife handles. Yeah. I actually have a knife handle you do? that I yeah that was made out of mammoth ivory. Wow. Yeah, and it's still to this day, not only is it legal, but it's common mm -hmm. to use mammoth ivory for different yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. So there's so much of it. Well, they're not well, an endangered species because they're... Uh, <laughs> exactly. Well, it's, it's a kind of a loophole. In this case, though, what we have is tusks that are being, again, dug out of the permafrost. Right. So how did they get there? That becomes the question. Right. It, does it have anything to do with human predation, or was it a natural catastrophe that somehow ended up putting all these mammoths down and burying them in the permafrost? That's the question I want to raise. Well, I think we raised a lot of questions. I think we, we got some pretty good answers. I think we had some great dialogue, and I really appreciate your time, all three of you guys. And uh, thank you to Malcolm, and thank you to Mark, and uh, thank you to young Jamie. Oh, well, thanks for hosting us. My pleasure. It was and a thank treat. you, Joe. It was a treat for Can me. I do a quick shout out? Yes, I shout wanna, it I, out. I want to thank Brad Young, Cameron Wiltshire, my brother Rowan, my wife Julie, for helping all make this possible. Uh, I also want to have people go to the Geocosmic Rex website and the Sacred Geometry International website for a lot more of this kind of stuff. Well, then I'm going to thank my beloved partner and wife, Santa, who's shared every adventure with me for the last quarter of a century. We've climbed the Great Pyramid together, we've been at the bottom of the ocean together, and I wouldn't be doing any of this stuff if it weren't for that wonderful woman behind me. Michael Shermer, who do you want to thank? Oh, I'll thank my wife, Jennifer, my little boy, Vinny, and uh, my agent, my lawyer. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, but uh, Skeptic.com and my partner, Pat, who, uh, you know, keeps the show running when I'm running around doing things like this. All right. And, and Joe Rogan. Oh. Let's thank Joe yeah, Rogan. Because yeah, I can Joe tell Rogan. you this, Joe. I speak all over the world. And whether it's South Africa or whether it's Japan or whether it's Britain or whether it's the United States or whether it's Croatia, people come up to me and they say, Joe Rogan sent me. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. I no, appreciate you have everybody's the most listening. interesting guests. No, you really. <laughs> well, you're one of them, dude. <laughs> All you guys are. Thank you so much. All, All right. right. We'll you. see you guys soon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. So long. Ooh.